Jason, did you say that there were some people in the city building that's there for this meeting? Yeah, so that, that might be a good good time to tell you what to expect. So the first agenda item is the Melhoff rezone. And there's a couple gentlemen that will be in person uh, in the same room as Ben. Uh, I think they're gonna have a presentation for Ben to pull up on his com computer. So Ben will be sharing his screen as they go through their presentation. Uh, the next agenda item uh, this related to the Summit Ridge townhomes, they will be, they're anticipated to be participating through Zoom. So we'll we'll bring them into the meeting when we get to that agenda item. Uh, and then the the third and fourth agenda items will, will there's, we're not expecting uh, a need for people to participate, but they'll be available by phone if you have questions for them. YouTube is live. Uh, my clock, it's not quite seven, so we'll hang on for just a second before we get started. Okay. Okay, it looks like it's seven o'clock, so we will get started. Everyone to our planning commission meeting on April 14th, 2020. Um, we typically get started with an invocation or a thought. Um, I will go ahead and offer that today. So um, I'd like to read a poem that was written by Laura Kelly Fanucci. You may have seen or heard this recently as it has been making the rounds, but I think it's worth hearing again if you have if you have or if you haven't so here we go when this is over may we never again take for granted a handshake with a stranger full shelves at the store conversations with neighbors a crowded theater friday night out the taste of communion a routine checkup the school rush each morning coffee with a friend the stadium roaring each deep breath a boring tuesday life itself when this ends may we find that we have become more like the people we wanted to be, we were called to be, we hope to be, and may we stay that way, better for each other because of the worst. Okay, and with that, we will move on to the Pledge of Allegiance. Would anyone like to lead us in the pledge? Okay. Um, I will lead us in the pledge since I'm not muted. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Trevor, you're on mute. Sorry, getting used to this. Um, a reminder to myself and everyone else, we need to hold down the space bar when we're speaking. Do we have an agenda that we can put up on the screen? Perfect, so there is the agenda and we will proceed in that order, starting with a public forum. <clears throat> Do we have any comments that are to be addressed to the commission during the public forum? We do have one. Um, this one came from Rolly Southridge Farms. Uh, <clears throat> Santa Cruz City Planning Commission, Rolly Southridge Farms continues to oppose the uh, presented zoning change from commercial zoning to R10 zoning for the proposed uh, Georgetown development on the Mohawk property. Our property is located adjacent uh, north to the considered Mohawk property. We have previously written a couple of letters outlining our concerns with pr this proposed zone change we continue to feel that the zone change would adversely affect us for the following reasons. Uh, bullet point one, the zone change is a departure from the plan that Santa Cruz City has envisioned for exit 242. Bullet point two, as a part of the ex exit 242 plan, Utah State University is working on a study and we feel it would be uh, made useless by any uh, sudden changes to the current zoning plan. 
and bullet point three, having that many people living next to our orchards presents problems to our farming operation. Our farm is fully operational and runs equipment, wind machines, chemical programs, pruning programs, and harvesting equipment. These operations can be disruptive to neighbors. Conversely, uh, neighbors can be disrupt, uh, disruptive to our operations. Uh, trans, uh, trespassing and vandalism is always a concern. This concern is amplified with such high density housing. Additionally, we feel Senequin City should consider the following before changing the zone. Uh, in the meeting of the Planning and Zoning uh, Commission a few weeks ago, the Georgetown development looked appe um, appeasing and was presented well, but we think it would be premature to recommend R10 housing status. If the economy continues to decline, a lot can happen between a zone change and the completion of a development. Properties could get sold, developers could drop out, and then um, we could be left with an R10 zoning that could be used any way that fits within the zoning zones regulations. Georgetown development um, that was presented in previous meetings should not be considered as part of the discussion of a zone change because there is no guarantee that the development would look like that after the change. If a zone change is going to happen, we would recommend that the change be contingent upon a development agreement that would ensure the completion of the proposed development. Thank you for considering our concerns. Best, uh, Rolly Southridge Farms. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any other public input during the public forum? Was that a no, Ben? Sorry, that would be a no. Okay, very good. So with that, then we will close the public forum at 7.05. And we will move on to agenda item 6A, the Melhoff property rezone. Okay, I'm going to try to bring up the presentation and share my screen and hopefully, we ha I haven't tried this in PowerPoint, so hopefully everything works out just fine. So let me do that and then I will step out of the way and let these good gentlemen sit down. Um, well, while, while Ben's doing that, I'll give just a quick introduction to this agenda item. So uh, this is the Melhoff property rezone, uh, it's proposed uh, to rezone approximately 35.39 acres from commercial C1 zoning to residential R10 plan unit development uh, or a, PRD, a PUD zone. Uh, this is located approximately 300 west and 1000 south. This uh, may be a, a different way of describing it. It's just south and, and a little west of the, the Rollies Red Barn. So uh, this has been on the agenda before. Uh, the applicants have, have uh, uh, shown a, a proposed uh, development plan. Um, the process for this is, is it's a legislative process. It'll require a recommendation from the, the planning commission and then the city council will, will ultimately make the decision on whether the rezone uh, happens or not. Uh, planning commission has held a public hearing on this uh, and then it was tabled and then it was tabled again uh, because the, the applicant wanted to take some, some more time to uh, refine their proposed development layout so that it was uh, the most accurate and, and, and showing a plan which, which would be uh, mostly compliant with our, our code. The reason I say that is because we haven't dove into a review of their plans yet, uh, but for purposes of illustrating what they want to do, uh, they wanted to make sure that it was it was going to be closest to being in compliance with our code. So with that introduction, Ben's got the, the presentation pulled up there for you. Uh, I'll turn it over to uh, John Dester, and it looks like he's got uh, Mr. Trent Melhoff there as well. So we'll, we'll turn the time over to them. Great. So this right here, um, I found that this is the only way to make it. Advantage. Oh, is it? Okay. okay so, so it's not just a matter of clicking the left button. No. We it, need to push that forward very good and, and this arrows don't work it's only the mouse on the, the, the mouse yep. on that arrow will go forward or backward yep you should be able to see him here and your presentations up okay. there and on their screen we'll and, see and, and, see and we can really see it right here can't we yep. we did. we're seeing everything here that we're seeing up there okay, okay. Yep. great thank you um i really think trent should should start and oh sure give you a background a little yeah. bit um, I'm not sure exactly what I said last time I was here three, uh, whatever it was a month ago. Anyway, I wanted to give you a little bit of a history on the property that I purchased 
it's probably been about, I can't even remember the exact, um, it's probably been five, six years ago that I purchased the 32 acres. And um, I, I in turn went to the city because I bought the property with the idea of moving my business from Springville over to Santa Quinn because I needed a little more room. There I have two acres. Here I needed more room. All the cameras here, look in there. <laughs> Sorry guys. Anyway, and so I came and I think uh, Dennis Marker was the city um, assistant city manager at the time. And I sat down and met with him. Um, I can't remember if I came before this planning commission or not at that time, but I asked them what I would need to do to develop five or six acres at the front. And it just got to be after what they wanted me to do with the uh, road in the front and the curb gutter, all the, just the infrastructure that needed to be take place in order for me to put a business there. There's just no way that I could afford to do it. It just, the, the dollars just didn't make sense. And so I, um, as I looked at the piece of property and I saw that it was commercial all the way back, I talked to Kirk um, Greenhall and I says, do you know why this is commercial all the way back that, that far? And he says, I think it was because of my, my operation back here is what I was told at the time. Anyway, so I, I questioned that at the time, you know, to begin with, but um, so as I looked at the property, I went through the, the financial, it just was not going to work at all. And so I just kind of let it ride, let it slide. And I think I came, I even came to him again over the period of, you know, four or five years or whatever it was, um, two different times. And there again, I just get into a situation where it just wasn't gonna work. So a friend of mine that I've done some business with came to me and said, hey, um, I want you to introduce you to John. He said, he does, he does the best developments in the county, um, in the state actually. Um, in using open space and so on and so forth. And so I looked at some of his projects and I thought, wow, this, these are nice stuff. I said, so we started talking and I thought, you know what, that'll help me facilitate bringing my business over here because the improvements that need to take place are so expensive that I can piggyback with that type of a situation. And then we can make this so that the commercial all stays in the front. And to give you a little bit of history of, of background of myself, um, I was raised in a family business um, in Orem. And I broke away from family probably 25, 30 years ago to do my own thing from family. Now I'm the only one in the business, but we had a piece of uh, commercial property that went back all the way. And and it's like where I am in Springville right now also is you've got, you've got commercial here and back behind it, you've got some other pieces that still haven't been developed, even though they did an RDA, which is redevelopment agreement with the city, and they improved it probably 10 years ago. You still don't have anything back beyond where the frontage road is. I keep looking up here, sorry. And um, the businesses that um, my family had that went back off of State Street the type of clientele that came in that were further back, even from State Street, were businesses that weren't really conducive. In fact, I could I could have taken some pictures and shown them to you of the type that you really want in the city because they become more of a, a more of a nuisance than um, than than a, a, some, you know for the city to say hey this you know having the commercial. So as we put this together, I thought. You know, the layout, as you see, as you'll see John, as he shows you, um, you'll see that it's, I think it's laid out perfect to facilitate commercial along the frontage road and I-15 that gives it the visibility. But if you go so far back, now if you if the master plan showed that there was a road that was going all the way from here, I don't, I can't show you on a map, all the way over across the tracks and up to Summit Ridge, then I could maybe see it a little bit, but as I, look, as I look at that, I think it's laid out pretty good and you've got like 18, I'm not sure exactly what the acres are, John. But I think it's 18 acres of commercial mm -hmm. in what's across the front there, which as I look back at, uh, uh, just about the point of the mountain, Lone Peak Trader Cells that was there. Once, once the area fills in with your residential areas, then 
I would eventually, I would think down the road, be bought out and you would have it broken down from say a five, six acre piece down to a, either half acre or one acre piece to facilitate the tax base in that area. But anyway, that's just a little bit of my background um, history. But as far as John goes, I don't think you'll find another developer in the county, in the state that does as good a job and has the best, a better reputation than he does. Thanks, Mr. That's, that's nice, Trent, but there, there's lots that do better than we do. But we, I have been doing it for a long time. And uh, I guess I, I might repeat myself and some of the things that I say from the earlier meeting only because I think we now have three more planning commission members that are seeing it for the first time. Am I right? I think, I think there's just one. one. Just oh, there's just one? Oh, sorry, you guys. Uh, I'll try to go through it quickly then. Um, the uh, the uh, We've been building these kinds of projects for 38 years. Architecture is something that I feel passionate about. I told you last time that we like to build projects that no two homes look alike. Um, I like to think that the that architecture is a gift to the street to where you have great architecture the street looks better and uh, i want to do projects to where when someone looks out their window and looks at their neighbor's house they like seeing their neighbor's house as much as they like seeing their own so you're looking back and forth at a, at a great project that's the goal always so um the things that i'm going to show you tonight i'll try to start advancing this um, this is similar to what you saw last time, but a little bit different in that we discovered that we needed 150 foot setback from the, um, uh, from the orchards to the north, or is that, is that north or east? That's north. North, north. north to the north. Um, so we've, we, can you guys see that pointer moving around? Do, do they see the, um, uh, the actual sure. pointer? I'm not seeing the pointer move. Yeah, oh, okay. I think I if you move to the right all the way, maybe. Yeah, I don't no. see it up on the big screen, but no, the, well, the pointer would be really helpful because I'm pointing at things. <laughs> but at the top, we've kind of grayed that area out. There's 13 homes there. Those we've grayed out and said, all right, what we'll do is we'll just kind of put it on hold in that area, uh, call it plat X or something. And, and do it when something changes on the, on the north side there. Um, if and when it does, then those lots could be platted at a future date. But I'm gonna move along here. Let me go back down, there's this part. The, you can see there where it's 17 and a half acres uh, on the, of commercial property that fronts the frontage road right there with one little piece on the other side of the frontage road. And, but my whole thing tonight is to explain what we would do if it's rezoned. I'm giving you a lot more detail at this level in that uh, um, I think uh, the, the Rollies mentioned something about why that it, it, if it's rezoned because of this particular design and product, and for some reason we backed out or didn't do it. We, there, it's always been contemplated that a development agreement would be struck to implement what you see here. So I get into a little bit of level of detail about the houses and the layout that maybe you normally wouldn't with just a zone change. Uh, but this is specific to this plan. Um, the, uh, the, the plan, you can see all that green and there's abundant landscaping and open space. And a few slides down the road, I'll tell you what those percentages are, but they're just off the charts as far as the amount of landscaping, the amount of park area and the amount of open space in the way we design something like this. Um, first off, there's four distinct different types of houses in this 35 acres. And I will get into those different types of houses in a minute, but central to what we've designed are the parks. And you just saw them in that big blob of green. That includes all the regular landscaping around each house. But specific park areas are located around the project, distributed throughout the whole project. There's, uh, I want to stress that there's a perimeter park. You may see where I've on the, 
behind the commercial area, we have a perimeter park running complete width of the project. That's really to divide the commercial from the residential so that when you drive down those two streets, when you get to the residential, the first thing you you encounter are parks right there. There's 10 parks, there they are. I just put little numbers on them so that you can see where they are. And I told you that the, the property, the project features four different kinds of houses. So let me quickly tell you the four types. These down there on what would be the south end, and we call them heirloom houses. I built uh, three or four projects using these type of, of houses in the arrangement or very similar to what you see there. We call it a pinwheel because if you look at where the garages are in the middle, so to speak, and the house kind of sprouts out from the center point of those garages, um, that's why it looks a bit like a pinwheel. There are multiple different um, elevations. There's three different styles of homes, and I'll show you those in a second. Um, and really unlimited different ways to make no two homes alike. You'll hear me repeat that because each project really, there's no reason why we would have any two houses look alike. These all have two car garages. They have two car driveways in front of um, the garage door. So this, this project has probably close to five units, if I mean five parking places per home. Um, and here, what, these are some pictures from previously where we built these types of homes. And the, in this case, I've, I've selected two houses up at the top that actually you can see the garage doors. Most of the time, you don't see the garage doors. You drive up a driveway and the, and the garage doors are hidden. So on the way we have this laid out, there are out of 18 homes, there's I think six of them that you could see their garage doors and 12 you can't. It's just a nice feature the, of, of that product. Each of these homes has a private fenced yard, as do all the projects that we do. And the, this happens to be an American Fork and the, uh, well, the two pictures of the park are American Fork. The other picture up in the corner is the, where I got the idea first in Seattle. That's the giant pine trees that you see behind it. So the next product is uh, we call a Concord townhome. They're built by a friend of mine that's a builder in Georgia. And they're fantastic. They're they're bigger. They are uh, 1,900 to 2,400. In addition to that, you can put a basement under them. They all have a two car garage. They have a two car driveway in front of it. No two homes need to look alike, and they have private fenced backyards. This is what they look like, and it, it's kind of a common layout, but it's a very uncommon uh, architecture that's applied to these. I think it's terrific. They uh, we see it in Utah with the garage door, then a man door, you know, an entry door, then a garage door and a man door. You don't see that readily with these houses. There's so much interesting architecture going on that they don't look like just a repeat. This is the backyards, uh, the way they do it in Georgia, they, uh, they do it that way. We just have fenced backyards and they're, they're substantial. The next thing are, are, are what I just call Georgetown townhouses because I've been building them for 38 years. They're in nearly every city in our county. Um, they're all around you here. I just haven't brought them to Santa Quinn yet. But um, they are in Salem, Spanish Fork, Payson, Provo, Orem, AFPG. And even though they're a smaller townhome, we're always able to make them look different. There are no two of them alike. They all have fenced backyards. If you can see the small squares where the garages are and there's a light green part, um, the light green part is the fenced yard. So although there are affordable end of things, they're still now, they're probably going to be 275 to 300,000, somewhere in there. Um, and, the, and that's a shame that that's considered affordable, but that's how much they cost to build. These are also a little bit bigger than what we what we built in the past. Um, let me go for those are the townhouses that you'd find in Salem, Spanish, and usually they have bigger trees that have grown up in the front. These are kind of recent pictures. They all look different. People like that. They like their house to have the red door, green door, the one with the dormers, things like that. 
The last part of this is the garden houses. These are single family detached. Um, they all have large fence backyards. They're very much like a traditional um, neighborhood. The, here again, we apply three different architectural styles to the house, make sure that no two are alike. So we can do that with exterior building materials and architecture to make sure that none are alike. Um, they also have four parking places per home uh, in that they have uh, a garage and uh, it, two in the garage and two in the driveway. In some cases, we can build a three car garage even. So you see that one would have more. We've just counted it as two in the garage and two outside. The reason I paused on parks again and, and wanna to return to that is I wanna explain a part of the parks there's within the parks, you can see bright green grass. And then are you seeing a little bit of olive colored um, that would be back by the fences and things? That's, that's called meadow. And when you have as much park and open space as we have in this project, we're treating that area that you see in the olive color like Daybreak does where that's called meadow. So it's not natural. It's not like we don't do something with it but it's planted specifically with low water requirement and uh, ah, seasonal flowers pop up. If you go to daybreak, they have a lot of that meadow type landscaping. So it contributes to the project, but, it, but as much as we've got, we've got to have meadow or the poor uh, homeowners association will go broke trying to mow it all, water it all. And uh, so that's uh, kind of the explanation about that this is, these are pictures of daybreak. You can kind of see areas of meadow and areas that are groomed landscaping. There's some more. It's really effective. So you get more landscape space, but at a little bit less cost. Parking, I wanna cover parking uh, in that we, we have, you see a little box there that says 712. We have 712 parking spaces throughout the project. And that does include up in the upper right hand corner, some RV parking. And we've tucked that up in that corner specifically because it backs up on Trent's RV sales. It's gonna look kind of natural to be up there in that area. But if we have that and we have spaces in there for RVs, it just, it just helps, it's good. Um, what we have is 712 parking spaces. You divide that by 178 units and we actually have four parking places per unit. So that's got to be, I don't know, not, I don't know, 50% more than most projects can do if we li literally have four per unit throughout the project. This slide shows and attempts to show the open space and the percentages. And I've got to look close at this uh, to see actual landscaped area is 48.51%. I think your ordinance requires 15%. This has 48%. And I've been trying to illustrate, that's a lot of green that you see right there. So the, the, the green and the, uh, and the meadow part is what we counted as landscape space. But when you go back and add up our private backyards that are still open space and driveways that are considered open space, at least in other cities, that's how it's calculated. We considered the landscape area, the limited common area, the concrete driveways and the sidewalks to be open space. We didn't count the, the roads, of course, but that area gives us 65.5% open space. So it's not a high density project. The, the simple calculation of dividing um, uh, 178 units by 35 acres, you end up getting five units per acre. In most any city, that would be considered at least low density, if not very low density, at just five per acre. So that's all we have. It results in a lot of a lot of open space. So I think that's really the. This is just how we might phase it and divide it up. We have some phases have two types of homes within the phase, and we like that because the idea would be to start pretty much the blue, the yellow, and the green all at the same time in that we're offering um, different kinds of product that don't necessarily compete. Whew. That's it.
any, I could love to answer any questions. What's that? And there's a, there, we, around the whole project, we figured that we'd use that concrete wall. And we're using it successfully on a number of our projects right now. It looks terrific and it's a great wall. Oh, that was done. Hey, John, one, one thing you, you didn't talk about that maybe the Planning Commission would appreciate some more detail on is the amenities that you have. I see you have a, a oh. small clubhouse and some tot lots and pavilions and things like that. Maybe Good go point. into a little bit more detail about that. I should have. And, and really, they're all over the project. Darn it. I wish I could point because I can point with my pointer, but you can't see it. Um, to the left side of the project, there's a clubhouse. And I think we were proposing a pool, but we might could be talked into doing a, uh, a splash. What are these? Splash, splash pad. pad instead of a so pool. What we might want to and do. Can I point up there? Will it show in there? What, what, what oh, gonna, you know what? What I'm going to do is I'm going to unshare my screen and then we'll just point it at the television. How's that? So, oh, oh yeah, we could walk up and just point to the stop share. You guys are, aren't seeing the share anymore, right? Correct. Ben. Okay, I'm gonna go up there, and um, we might need to come a little bit closer. But but if you want to walk up there, we'll we'll try to. I got another that. idea. This might work. It accomplishes what you're trying to do. If I take oh the smaller one. Okay, that's fine. And I hold it up to the. This might. Um, Can I see you? Yeah. Is it is it just backwards for me? Um, <laughs> well, let me no, it's upside down, right? Let me, uh, now it's not backwards, and it's and it's right. Can you and all? I'll see that. So, mm, I feel like a weather guy. <laughs> Don't those weather guys aren't now? I know how good they are. Wow, this is strange. There is a clubhouse, and either a pool or a splash pad. There's lots of comment about and an opinion about whether to do that i've built plenty of clubhouses and plenty of pools indoor outdoor all of them so this project at 178 units warrants a clubhouse and a pool or a splash pad but spread throughout the project there would also be pavilions we found in our other project that pavilions are really used a lot and if you have an outdoor pavilion that's uh, maybe 18 feet by 30 feet with picnic tables in there that's the most used thing on projects because people gather together there and have picnics and the like so we've got a pavilion right here among for these houses there's a pavilion among the townhouses right here there's the odd gazebo or uh the other thing that people like are pergolas and that's just to go sit and and talk to be able to i'll meet you at the pergola and we'll talk so those are spread around the project. Each time there's a pocket park, I actually can't see what's in that pocket park. I can't even see where my finger is right here, but I guarantee you that in that, in that area, there's gonna be a gazebo or a pergola in each of the pocket parks that are spread around the project. And there's either two or three pavilions. Let me take a look at this. One, two, two pavilions and a clubhouse. So for this size project, and then playgrounds. One, two, I show two playgrounds right now, but somebody could talk me into a third if they thought we needed it. Um, the, the, the houses that are down around here that I said, those houses appeal, I forgot to mention, they appeal greatly to retirees and busy professionals that there I'm selling the heck out of these in Provo um, because they have a private fenced yard. So you can have a little garden and things like that, but um, they're just perfect for that. They have main floor masters. Uh, our two story or single story plans have master bedrooms on the main floor in all of these. There's only 18 of them. So I'm kind of looking for 18 folks down here in the south end of the county to be in that that's a solution for those 18. What else have I forgotten? Could, 
Could you explain again, I, I, maybe I missed it in the first intro, why that future plot X is not part of the plan this time? Or I don't know if that goes along with Jason with the, some of the changes he had to make for city code. Yes. When we realized that we the, the houses that are adjacent to agricultural, and of course we are here, Rolly's Farms right there, they have to be, you have to have a 150 foot setback. We now have a lot more than that actually, by the time you get to these little white houses that are right there. The way we're accomplishing that is we're saying, this is part of the project, but I don't know how many years from now we may be able to put those 13 houses back in. But if we take and designate them right now, is then that's just kind of one lot and it's called lot one, plat X, and has a covenants recorded against it that say nothing can be built here until circumstances change. Someday, if rollies aren't there, then it would that would change the circumstance. If your ordinance changed, that would. Things could, could enable us in the future to actually build those. For right now, we wouldn't. The alternative to that is really pretty easy too. Maybe before this is all said and done, this area it turns into literally 150 foot setback. It's park and meadow. We redistribute the 13 homes down through the whole project. I can see a way of doing that that doesn't damage the project at all. So there's two ways of accomplishing that, meeting that part of your ordinance. You guys are so quiet. Thanks, Mr. Dester. That was a very good presentation. Um, Thanks for the opportunity. Hard, Certainly. Yeah. Um, I, I'd just like to commend you on the preparation that went into this. It's a very nice looking proposal, perhaps one of the best we've seen. Um, so um, with that said, I would invite further questions um, from the commissioners. While um, you were thinking about that, Jason, would it be possible to pull up a zoning map for the city and show us where this proposed rezone falls on that zoning map. I think we may have looked at it before, but I think it'd be helpful to see it again now. And while Jason's working on that, um, commissioners, feel free to ask questions. I was gonna ask, so could we take the, the 13 mm -hmm. single family homes that you're not able to build now and potentially build more heirloom? We could. In, because and I, indeed see that's a, something... I see a very high demand for maintenance-free senior living. And so I feel like that's really, probably where our needs are. I agree. I think some of the townhomes taken out and adding the yeah. rooms. Down at the very bottom there, is, I only have two. Can you guys see that? Yeah, you can. There's only two right there. Really, if I, if I work that over, there's room for another or another or outright um, uh, do more. The reason I, I limited it to 18 is I kind of think that 18, as opposed to just doing a butterfly of that and doing a second version that would put 36, we did sell 42 of them at American Fork. So um, yeah, we could, <laughs> we could. I, I would hate to lose any more green space or kind of your spacing that's so great about the project. Is there any way on the west side to, you know, just that one row of, you know, four townhomes or something to remove that and, and push, you know, some more of the heirloom that way or widen the pinwheel, if you will, um, you know, something along those lines. Yeah, the, the a thing to point out, I want to share with you that the way we really did these pinwheels before was this building was connected to this building. And then it looks more like a pinwheel. But you see the green space between it? We discovered in Provo that we could only really fit X number of homes. It was 18 uniquely. And what happened is we had the room to pull these apart and make them just twin homes instead of making them groups of four. Way better. There's light and ventilation around the whole house this way. So that simple change makes this project and the one in Provo better than three previous versions where the groups of four were together. We had the room to do it, so I pulled them apart. And this, uh, I think I mentioned, there's probably room for improvement and change, 
But at this stage, I wanted to just say, this is what we'd like to do in Santa Quinn. Whether we tweak it and put more of this or less of that, you know, when we were told that we could only build 178, that's low density compared to what we'll plat. We have similar products in Provo and Pleasant Grove that are 10, 10 units. So that's twice. So this is very open and lots of green area compared to previous projects. Jason, could you shed any light on any other changes that since the last time that we were not seeing as far as a, from a zoning standpoint or city kind of code center? Well, there's not, not, not too many changes that they made. Like I say, uh, without doing a thorough review, one of the things that we noticed was, was that 150 foot requirement from agricultural users. And so uh, obviously that was, that was something that was gonna really impact their, their layout, their proposed layout for, for this possible development. So um, their, their solution was to, to just control timing rather than start moving things around and, 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 and significantly changing the layout. So, um, you know, a question was brought up of, in the, the public comment about uh, the development agreement. Uh, it's proposed with this, this proposed zoning is R10 with a PUD on it. And by nature of being a PUD, it, it has to have a development agreement any way you look at it. Uh, otherwise that PUD doesn't go in, into effect. So uh, th those are things like that, uh, or, or that, that PUD could be a tool to address things like that um, to make sure that, that, you know, that plat doesn't happen until something changes. Um, um, so that, that's, that's the, the really main change. I know planning commissioners had some other questions about, about depths of the commercial spaces and proximity to, to the gravel pits and stuff. And, and John could speak to that in a bit. Maybe, maybe while I'm, I'm talking uh, with, with, with the, the way Zoom works, I'll, I'll share my screen and, and answer your previous question about the zoning. Um, so you should see my screen up there now. Um, so the, the, the property uh, in discussion right now is, uh, here's the South Interchange right here. Uh, it would just be north in this purple C1 area. Uh, the specific property that, that they're looking at, um, if I zoom in a little bit closer, you can see the, the, the parcel lines. Uh, this parcel that, that crosses the 300 west, and then the parcel down below, yes, uh, those are the two parcels that make up the, the entirety of their project. So um, if, if, if you were to see their map again, uh, the, the front, front part of that would be, would remain C1 commercial, and their proposal is to change this back part to an R10 with a PUD designation on top of that. So uh, does that answer your question? Chairman Wood? Yes, it does. Thank you. We have some commissioners who want to ask some questions. So let's go with uh, Commissioner Gunnell. Commissioner Gunnell, remember to press the space bar. Thank you. I was pushing the space bar and it wasn't working. Um, Jason, I was just asking, the general plan that's on the city website is from 2012. Is that still the most recent general plan we have? That's correct. And, and we've, we've been talking about doing a general plan update uh, this year. Uh, this may not be the best year to do it with, with the need for town hall meetings and, and these social distancing uh, requirements and recommendations. This may not be the best year to do it. Um, that plans maybe change a little bit, but yeah, we're, we're due for another general plan update and it's something that is gonna be happening sooner than later. Okay. Um, yeah, so I have some more comments. I don't necessarily have questions about this specific development, but I do have comments about the potential rezone going here. Go ahead. Um, well, I don't have any complaints about the quality of the proposed development. I, you know, as far as residential developments, I like what I see here. I think it's well thought out. I don't have any, you know, I don't see any way I could offer an improvement. Um, my bigger issue is just with the idea of, is this the right development to go in this place um, where we're limited? You know, if Jason wants to go back to our zoning map to see just how much of a chunk this is going to take out of our remaining commercial. I mean, it's... 
you know, at least a third of our remaining commercial zoning on the south end of town that we're going to be converting over to residential. And I just don't know where we make this up. Um, because it goes all the way from that bottom left corner of agricultural down to the track line above the second C1. And it's taking the heart out of it. Um, I'm concerned about the effect it's going to have on the existing uses neighboring it with the gravel pit to the west, the orchards to the north. Um, they've both expressed that they would rather not see the zone change take place because of the effect it can have on them. And then I just pulled up the city code. And in order for us as a planning commission to grant approval for rezoning or to make a positive recommendation, there are three findings that we have to make. Um, one, we have to find that it conforms to the intent of the city general plan and annex annexation policy plan. I think this is just general plan because it's obviously not an annexation. We also have to determine that it's not going to adversely affect the surrounding properties. And then the third one is that it's not going to cause property structures or uses to necessarily become non-conforming. So I'm not concerned about the third finding that we have to make, but I've been going through the general plan this past week, and there's a lot in the general plan about what we want to do here in the south end of town that, you know, I don't think that this really conforms to that intent. And given the concerns we've heard from the surrounding, from the two neighbors adjoining the property, I don't know if we can make the finding that this rezone is not going to affect them. And so those are my two concerns is I like the development, but I don't think we should do this rezone based on what we have to find in order to do this. So Chairman Wood, if I could, uh, to address the zoning map, uh, sometimes this is uh, uh, questions we get here in our office, walk-ins, look at it, and, and uh, they ask where, where commercial zoning is at. Uh, the C1, the purple area, is not the only place for a commercial. Obviously, the, the core area of town, the CBD, MSC, MSR, are places where commercial can happen as well. Uh, we also have a couple pockets of RC zoning where it can happen. And then the, the really the big commercial area uh, that is not indicated is, is the east side of the railroad tracks in Summit Ridge. Now, there is, it, per de the development agreement, some, some residential that can happen in there. In fact, the next agenda item is this is significant residential development, but um, there's still hundreds of acres that are in there that that uh, are are expected to be commercial. So uh, I think zoning maps sometimes uh, can be a little misleading that way uh, based on the, the name of the, the zone that they're in. But I think that just provides a little bit more clarity and context of, of what is zoned to be commercial in, in Santa Quin. And Jason, while you've got this map up, where is the light rail hub that was proposed to be or for you know forecast where was that looking to be so yeah so to speak to that a little bit so it, it was in the regional transportation plan uh it's since been taken out however that doesn't mean it's not going to happen it just means it's it's maybe not on the 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 horizon like uh was originally thought as you know or you, as you might know uh the, the most northern um front runner station was was shut down just due to, to not a high number of ridership. So uh, for, per, for those purposes, this this uh, front runner hub is not shown on the regional transportation plan, but eventually the numbers will warrant it. And it's still something that we kind of have in the back of our mind. So um, zoom in just a little bit. This is the second interchange. Uh, this is Summit Ridge. You can see this line right here. You can see my cursor, right? OK. So you can see this line coming down uh, here. That is the railroad tracks. Uh, the new soccer fields are about right here. Uh, that area around that those soccer fields is, is where it was originally shown on the regional transportation plan to have a UTA uh, front runner station. So again, that's probably way down the road, but nonetheless, it's, it's in the back of our heads uh, as that area develops and, and and considering that there could be a front runner station in that area. Okay, yeah, thank you. I just, in going through the general plan, it made lots of references to that, you know, intermodal transfer hub and things like that. And I just wasn't certain where that 
had been proposed to be. Um, the other point I would make is if we're going to rezone this, I think we need to take a look at the entire area here um, instead of just making a one parcel rezone. You know, we're supposed to be a planning commission and setting a vision for what's going on here. So I'd like to see us plan and say, okay, if we put this here, how does this change what we see happening with surrounding uses instead of just kicking that can down the road and leaving, you know, commercial orphaned over there at the gravel pits and everywhere else. I know the city's plan, you know, looks a little different. You know, the general plan showed a rodeo arena going in here. And that's obviously the city's changed focus to doing that nearby the elementary school. And so, like, if we do this, if we can make the findings we have to make, then I think we need to be a little uh, proactive here and looking at, okay, now that we've moved this domino, what other dominoes need to move for this to be a cohesive plan for the South End of Town? Thank you, Commissioner Gunnell. Those are uh, pertinent comments. And um, I'd like to say that I agree with most of the points you've made. Um, and I'd like to add to that that um, one concern with this area is that we'd be creating an island zone, essentially, where we've got residential completely surrounded by commercial uses and agricultural. Um, so I'd like to echo what Commissioner Gunnell said, that it, I think it would make sense that if we were going to rezone part of this, it would be better to do it as part of a more comprehensive effort uh, to plan for this area as a whole. Um, with that, I'm going to apologize to Commissioner Tolman because she had raised her hand, so I'll recognize her for comment now. That's okay. I should have lowered my hand because Brad said everything that I thought too. Um, another one of my biggest concerns also is the same that there would just be an island of residential there. I think it's hard to um, speak to the future, like Jason said, where east of the um, train tracks down there in Summit Ridge would have residential or commercial. We don't know that. I don't think we could plan around something that isn't already in the plan right now. Um, so I I don't think we should rezone. Okay, thank you. Uh, commissioners, any other thoughts or questions for the applicant? So my, my, my main concern, was, and Jason, maybe you can speak to this a little bit more, is actually probably the same concern which is if this was to be done, um, with the intent for this developer, you know, because this, you know, looks good, um, that if they backed out or something that the rezone would be, you know, sold off and then it would be something that we didn't, wouldn't want. But can you speak to that? You know, obviously the PD would have to go through a whole design review and, you know, the entire development agreement would have to be part of it. Is that, you know, could you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, and, and that's that's a great point that that uh, um, you know, and maybe the development agreement, while it would be required as part of a PUD, um, maybe this could be tied to the rezone itself, so that that uh, you know it's understood that that it be developed in the way that it's been presented to you. Um, you know, that could be something. Again, this is a legislative action, so everything's on the table in terms of negotiating how how this would play out. But that that is a good point that if it were to be rezoned R10. Uh, you know, that rezone would be in effect. Uh, obviously, the PUD is something that uh, they would want to have happen concurrently so they can get these densities that, that would, would be a little bit uh, more dense than, than the standard R10 requirements would allow. So, uh, but yeah, that's, that's a good point that, that uh, you, we just want to, to think through how, how this, uh, how this rezone would be structured so that the there's, there's a, a good expectation on both sides of what, what is going to happen. And, and therefore, if, if something were to happen with the economy and, and the developer couldn't move forward with that, that there would be a clear understanding of, of how that would um, result from, from any unexpected uh, impacts from the economy. So how, what would that look like for us? What, what do we, what would we need to do? Is this, because is this, this proposal is to rezone as an R10, not an R10 PUD. So that would need to be changed because I'd be in favor of an R10 PUD with this specific, you know, uh, development. It, it would just be the timing of the development agreement instead of, instead of rezoning it. Um, and it would probably be something like rezoning it contingent on a development agreement being executed uh, rather than just rezoning it and then waiting for the development agreement to come 
uh, later, uh, it would be done up front. So um, yeah, the, the, the PUD in, its, in and of itself is looked at like a rezone. So uh, the R10 and the PUD would happen concurrently um, is, is what their proposal is. I wouldn't suggest just rezoning an R10 and then working through a PUD process. I think it would want to happen concurrently, but yeah, what, what, what I would suggest the, that you do or, or the city does, if, if that's the route they want to go, is to do that development agreement up front and make the rezoning contingent on the execution of a development agreement. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Or not even, you know, do the rezone contingent on anything, work, work through and get a development agreement in place so that it can happen with uh, a potential rezone. So there, there's, like I say, it just, it's, it's, it's how we craft uh, and, and approach that, that thing, if, that, if that's the, the direction the city so chooses. I, can I say something, Commissioner? Please go ahead. So, I guess I definitely don't want us to adversely affect any of our um, neighbors with this project. However, I don't know how we're really going to be able to control that. Um, any commercial business could come in right now and it could be a much worse situation for the neighbor. So I don't know how we can really mitigate that. Um, I've been through many Georgetown developments and I really, really highly admire how much they put into them. And I do think our community is in a dire need of maintenance free senior living. Okay, very good. Thanks for those comments. Let me turn this this way so that Trent can. I had a question. Um, or is there any suggestions that those who, who didn't want to see the island out there, what would you recommend as, a, as it being commercial? What would you suggest that would you have of what type of businesses would you want to see going back there or commercial? Well, I'll go with that. I mean, what I've always envisioned this property as being is similar to what we see between Spanish, or, yeah, Spanish Fork and Springville, west of the freeway. Um, where it's light industrial commercial uses. Um, they exist off the freeway. Um, it's actually going through rapid development right now, the remaining property there. And my understanding has been that the city is looking at Project 242 with that tourism in the area. Um, I know we're in discussions with Juab County and Utah County to move the county line to facilitate that. Discussions with Utah State University. So. Now, I necessarily see this as being undevelopable commercial. You know, that's not to say that it makes sense to do it right now, but I definitely is there, see is, is, Do Rollies, is there a home over there? I can't really get up a point, but is there a home? I'm not sure where the home, the residential home. Yeah, there's Rollies. a home about 150 feet from that dirt road on the other side of a red metal sheet barn. Right there. So right behind him is also zone commercial? That's actually, that's, all. that's actually city property. Yeah, that's, that's the city on parcel there, that triangle. And that's commercial also. But it's it's a gravel pit, city owned. So that's a long ways back. That's a long ways back from where you'd normally have commercial going all the way back there. That's, that's a long ways off for, for a commercial type project. But. What businesses are you referring to, Brad, as for in Spanish Fork Springville? I know you kind of said the idea of them, but what are actual businesses over there? Um, I'm just looking at all the light industrial. There's some live work combo stuff going in um, behind what used to be new ways. Um, you got young families, you got a lot of the warehouse space and things going on back there. Um, I just went last week or not last week. Um, back in February, I went and met with a guy there that's, you know, he's got a little shop where he makes lots of little fishing gadgets, you know, kind of a small commercial light uh, manufacturing facility where he lives actually above the garage. Would this uh, C1 zone allow for light industrial then? 
and would you know the rural lease appreciate like trucks and things going to warehouses to do pickups and deliveries down that road um you know any developments obviously going to affect them i think part of what they're worried about is you know the orchards do have a big problem with people wandering into the orchards and taking family pictures you know they come in and try and harvest asparagus and so they see a lot more trespassing as a result of residential development versus guys that are just there from nine to five working while they're there and leaving after. To that point as well, I would say um, the last time we looked at this, which was in the February 25th meeting, I believe, um, we had a gentleman speak, not on this uh, rezone proposal, but it was on a later agenda item. And I don't wanna put words in his mouth, but he made his comments on the record um, and they're part of the minutes and the, and the recording. So I'll attempt to paraphrase. Um, but he said he his family has a farming operation in one of the neighboring communities. I believe it was Salem. And they've been doing it for a long time. And over time, as, as they've seen residential uses get closer to and encroach on their operation, um, he said it's been harder and harder for them to keep operating their farm. Um, and one thing he pointed out that really stood out to me was that um, when you have... 200 residential people right next to your operation, that's potentially 200 voices of opposition to what you're doing versus, you know, maybe one or two commercial voices who certainly would have some impact. You know, anyone next door is going to have some impact, but the difference of one or two potential, you know, voices or naysayers compared to 200, it's a, it's a big deal for them. Um, and so anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Well, I think we saw a little bit of that last night as they had the wind generators running in the orchards and we had people on social media complaining about the helicopters flying over all night. And just people, residential folks, not understanding what they're getting into moving into an orchard. Yeah, um, Commissioner Tolman, you wanted to make some comments. Um, I just had a question because I wasn't sure. Is a business park um, with office buildings considered commercial? So to, to answer that question of what, what can be done with this, the, in, within the C1 zone, it's, it's hard to summarize it because, uh, in fact, I'll share my screen and show you because I've got it pulled up. Um, there is just a number of things that can happen in the C1 zone. So the C1 zone will be in this, this column here. But as you scroll through, uh, there's just a, a whole different, a whole bunch of different things that can happen. So it's you know, it takes some time to look into it, but research and development and related office space. I mean, there's a number of different things that could probably professional offices and financial services. I think a business park could probably fit within the, those categories. Um, but, you know, if there's questions of what can happen in the C1 zone, this, this would just be the place to go look at it. And, and anything from a taxidermy shop to schools to restaurants to religious centers to pawn shops to mortuaries to just a number of different things uh, you know i guess even multifamily dwelling can happen in the c1 zone uh does it say the liquor store oh, could go in sorry. there sorry i apologize for that let me sorry kylie it cannot happen it's actually not not a permitted use so uh, i apologize for that i guess you can look at if it's permitted conditional or not permitted so um, yeah, that would be the place to look at it. Sorry, go ahead, Kylie. Oh, I was just saying, can a liquor store go there? Because I think that would definitely adversely affect everyone. Yep, uh, alcoholic beverage class A license is a permitted use. Class B is is not permitted, uh, which would be like a bar. Uh, but you could have restaurants and clubs, uh, hotels, conventions. Those are permitted uses. Uh, a liquor store would be a permitted use. Um, so yeah, it's like I say, it's hard for me to just tell you whether it, it it's allowed or not. There's just a number uh, of different things that can happen. Jason, the liquor store is actually not a permitted use. That class A is beer only. That would be like a grocery store that offers beer in the cooler or a gas station that has beer it's, in the walk-in. It says alcoholic beverage class E liquor store. Oh, sorry, I was looking at A. So I, I kind of want to just bring up like in Lehigh by Cubbies, you've got a nice big commercial complex. And then just to the north of that, you've got several different 
PUDs with different types of housing. I've sold several homes in there. Um, and you put the high density next to the commercial as a buffer, just like the city council just did over here on 4th East. I, I guess from a planning perspective, like Jason, what do you think from a planning perspective? Because I guess we don't really have the education. Well, that's the thing with this one is, is it could go either way. Uh, like has been mentioned, uh, the city's trying to take a more proactive approach to, to planning certain areas. I mean, we have a zoning map, we have a general plan, uh, but it's not gonna go in, into the type of detail that, that is, is gonna really definitively give you, give you uh, a, a specific uh, plan or uh, an expectation of what's gonna happen. That's why we, we've, we've proactively tried to initiate this, this uh, visioning of 242 intersection area. We called it Harvest View. We're, um, a couple of different things. We work with Utah State University with this this concept and this idea of agritourism. Uh, we have a lot of wonderful, very innovative agricultural users in our city. So uh, that's something that we thought could preserve the heritage of Santa Quinn, but also provide you know the economic development uh, activity that that could be beneficial to our city. Um, but that, that's not to say that, that in, in that type of a vision is all going to be commercial. Uh, there could be, you know, like, like we know that there's going to be residential down in, in that area. And, and, you know, those will, those will be things that we'll look at is making sure they have kind of an agricultural touch to them or, or a, a feel to them. Um, that, that's the thing is it's, it's a, it was a vision at, at, at the, it's all we've gotten to at this point. There's no plan in place. And, and we've really just, just thrown that idea out and we want to, to dig a little bit deeper and, and come up with that vision. So um, from a planning perspective, it, again, I think the fact that it's zone commercial is, is in part due to its, its proximity to the, the interchange down in that area. But um, you know, it's not to say that, that maybe a, a different land use or, or I think you know, some of the points that Mr. Melhoff has brought up about, about it being a very deep commercial par parcel are, are, are justified. So it's, I don't have like a, a silver bullet for you of what the, the right answer is here. It's, it's, this is, you know, really up in the air. And, and, and frankly, that's, that's why we have these legislative processes to, to, to talk about this, hash it out and, and really come up with, with what we feel is going to be best for the community. So I don't want anyone to think I'm being insensitive. My family are farmers in this community. I live in the orchards right next to a controlled atmosphere building that we store apples in. I'm very familiar with the agricultural heritage here. However, um, I hate to turn away a, a business that is going to create a tax base. And I hate to turn away a developer that is gonna bring a really nice classy project to our town. So I'm a proponent. I'll let you guys do what you're gonna do. I just wanna get my two cents in. Thanks, Kylie. Um, appreciate those comments. Uh, Commissioner Curtis. Yeah, so I just had the last couple of comments. Um, Kylie, it's funny you bring up that uh, support in Lehigh because I actually used to live in that uh, uh, residence behind JCWs and over by Cubbies uh, in college. And it was great having the businesses close by. Um, but I think we keep talking about the negative of, oh, the residences are not going to like the orchards next by and things like that. My sister lives on the north uh, west side of town. And she lives back, backs up to the orchard and she loves it. It's like her favorite part. She sees the orchard, she sees it blossom in the spring. It's her favorite part of living there. That's why she wanted to live there. So um, I think there's gonna be just as many positive things. And kind of to Kylie's point, I think we don't know what could go there. I think we look at this project and we say, okay, what would be better in this space? And the only thing I can think of that would be necessarily better is nothing there. I mean, I think we all love the open space and we live in Santa Cruz because it's, you know, spread out so just nothing um and not ever developed but is that realistic is it never going to get developed probably not and so my thing is you know maybe a couple handful of commercial businesses all the way deep back in the project might be a little bit better but i also look at all the negatives that could go there um, other commercial businesses that we don't want or that cause more problems for the orchards at this point we have basically an offer brought to us or a plan brought to us that looks good and it, it is nice and it's what we already know for the future versus an unknown and the biggest thing i think that trumps kind of everything is that it brings in businesses right now because we keep talking about oh we want commercial you know brad you brought it up 
and I agree with you, you know, we don't want to take up this commercial space and we need more commercial on the south side of town, but this brings in businesses literally right, you know, right now, which is what we've, you know, the city, I feel like, um, you know, back when city council elections were going on, that's what kind of the main thing was, we need commercial tax base, we need more businesses. So we'd be turning away not only a development, but also businesses. Right, but I think that we'd be restricting future developments if we allowed a residential space in this big commercial space, because say a movie theater wanted to come in, now we don't have space because there's these homes here. So I think it's more important to not restrict future commercial business growth for that reason that you just said. Yeah, agreed. And like you said before, right, we have no idea what the future is going to hold. So, um, and you know, we, we don't know what businesses we're coming in. And, you know, with 479 units coming in, you know, less than a mile south here along Summer Ridge Parkway, I think that we're actually poised right now to see commercial development happening here. Um, Jason, do you have the ability to pull up the city code? Yep. Because this is a point of clarification that I want to understand is so, and you know, maybe this is on me for not having looked at this sooner. I'm looking at what is this 10.1076 rezoning. So section C here is what I'm looking at. The requirements for approval. And I don't know, maybe you or Ben can explain this, but the way I read this is if both the planning commission and city council do not make all three findings, the rezone cannot happen. And so in the past, I don't know that we've made these findings. I haven't heard a lot of discussion, you know, especially about number one here tonight, but what's, you know, from you and Ben, what's the implications here of the section C requirements to approve rezone? So, we, we have this language here, and, and this is meant to be, uh, you know, criteria and guidelines that, that can help guide the, the city as they make these decisions. In, in this case, it would be uh, criteria that helps with, with uh, the rezoning of property. Um, but like has been mentioned, when it comes to, to legislative decisions, uh, it's really the, the discretion of the city. That's, the, I guess, the beauty of, of your recommendation tonight is, is is each of you have a vote and, and you make a recommendation. Uh, and that's, that's gonna be your, your own unique perspective on, on this legislative action. These, these are, are meant to be there to, to guide you. Um, you know, the city general plan is, is a document that should be uh, looked at and should be referenced as much as possible. It's, it's, it's the community's vision. Um, but, um, and I, 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 I don't, I don't put this lightly, but the general plan by itself is not binding. So uh, the, the thing that's binding is, is city ordinances and, and codes and development agreements and things of that nature. So um, it, it does. Uh, okay, well, I'm looking at the first sentence that says, in order to grant approval, the planning commission and city council must find that. Right. And that doesn't look very much like, you know, things to consider. It's like, if we don't do this, we can't rezone. Okay, so and to your point about the general plan, it doesn't say it has to conform to the general plan, just to the intent. It leaves the wiggle room there. Right. The, you Isn't know, we leave the general plan, and that's obviously a living document, something that changes as facts on the ground change. But, you know, if we don't make these three findings, can the rezoning happen? Because the way I, I read I this, it could. And, I don't and, think we can. And, and the point that I'm making is, is the general plan doesn't specifically, uh, you know, dictate exactly what every little parcel is going to be like. It gives a, a very general perspective on, on how the city develops. So uh, that's the thing is it's hard to, to pinpoint what, what everything's going to be. It, it's, it's naturally going to leave a little bit of flexibility with, with everything that happens. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, th these are your, your three criteria that, that you look at when you consider a rezoning. And, and to go on, uh, on, on this, uh, no, sorry, um, on this point as well, um, Brad, I think what you're looking at is the word must and does the planning commission usurp the authority of the city council by the word must in this ordinance? And I would have to say, no, it does not. 
Um, if there is uh, certainly the planning commission is a recommending authority and and the city council highly respects and uh, values the opinions of the uh, city council or excuse me the planning commission but the elected leaders are the uh, the people's representatives and and therefore they are the authority and if there is a conflict in city code where two points are are in conflict um, it always goes to the developer. So even if this was in con contest one with another, the, the, the state uh, uh, Supreme Court would side with the developer on that particular case if, if in fact our codes are, are conflicting. Ambiguous. Yeah, and Ben, on that, can I ask that we get the city attorney's opinion because I don't read B and C as necessarily conflicting, you know? I think that um, you know, the way we I read this, that you need both to go forward. And so I'd ask that we get the city attorney to weigh in here because I'm a little concerned about things that we've done in the past without even discussing the general plan we've made rezoning decisions. So I know that one of the city council members has always told me that it's a guiding document. It's supposed to guide us, but obviously the city council has made adjustments to the master plan because they just did that on fourth east with the commercial up here. So um, and I understand that, but the fact is, in our previous rezonings, I don't remember even discussing it, and much less making a finding as our city code is asking us or requiring us, in my mind, to do. Yeah. No, I've, I've looked at the general plan, and it says that, you know, I'm looking at guideline seven under land use, that growth should be directed to locations contiguous to existing development or on infill properties. I mean, there's a lot in here that applies to what we're discussing tonight, but I haven't heard any of it mentioned. I'm grateful you do the homework, Brad. Sometimes I worry I do too much. It sounds like it's very ambiguous and subjective as far as these recommendations and where it goes against the general plan because the vision for Harvest View 242 I don't think this like eliminates it and it really has never even brought in where at on exit 242 right off the exit or how far north or how far south it's just really kind of subjective yeah the, the vision for 242 the harvest view is not a part of the general plan that's that's something that's that's being worked on and could be in conjunction with the general plan update uh yeah I, I think Brad's Brad's points are 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 well taken. That that and and I couldn't agree more. That we need to to be more familiar and 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 make sure that that we're we're looking at the general plan. Now it's it's difficult sometimes because the general plan is a a big ugly scary document and it's really long and and that would be one of my goals as as we move forward with the general plan plan update is to make it concise and and to to make it a better tool for everybody to use and to look at. But uh, yeah, I, we're, we're happy to, to have the, the city attorney weigh in on this. Uh, my understanding, like I say, is, is that the general plan and, and uh, the, these types of, uh, this type of language that's in the code uh, is not necessarily going to bind the city council for making a decision, but you know, it's, it's generally a, a, a guideline or, or a, a best practice to be, to be consistent with plans that the city's done in the past that, that you know, Required a lot of work and, and, and receive a lot of public input. So uh, I think that that is a, a point well taken that that uh, looking at the general plan is important. It, it kind of sounds like everybody's minds made up. So I think we should probably just move forward. I don't think any more discussions really going to change anything. So I would just say it has been a good discussion. And regardless of the um, legal points we just talked about, um, and I think it would be good to iron that out. Um, I'd like to circle back around and just restate that I think if we are going to pursue a rezone in this area, it would make sense to do it as part of a more comprehensive plan for the area um, that potentially would include all of the stakeholders involved, right? And like was stated earlier, we are the planning commission. And so it would make sense to look at the plan for this area and do it as a comprehensive effort with everyone involved rather than just a single island parcel um, so th that's kind of my feelings on it. And I'll just make one last point. I mean, whichever way it goes, I think the intent of those three findings that we're supposed to make is that I don't think rezoning 
is supposed to happen lightly. I don't think it's supposed to be easy. Uh, landowners buy property knowing what zoning is. Neighbors look at how areas around them are zoned and make decisions on what they're going to do with their property. You know, people buy based on how close they are to certain uses. And I think that rezoning is intended to be difficult because people have vested rights in their current zoning and in the zoning around them. And so I think, you know, that's the intent of those three findings is it's supposed to be something that only happens when it's absolutely right. Well said. I would agree with you, but I uh, obviously a lot of this zoning was uh, done years and years and years ago before the city had any kind of idea of what the heck was going to happen with the city. And so to say it should be so hard to change, I agree. Some zones in the first place. No, and I absolutely agree with you. Um, you know, where the general plans from 2012, who knows how old this zoning is. I actually looked for that and couldn't find it. But, you know, when we do change, I think we should change it for the area and step back and take a wider view. Agreed. And that's why we're, we're due for a general plan update is, is even over eight years, uh, you know, the population that moves in, the, the demographic can change and people's, people's uh, feelings change and you know i mean look at us right now we're doing a public meeting on through zoom uh things change and and uh different different priorities come up but uh you know i i think i think you could sum up the general plan by by saying that that we need to be careful and and try and preserve our agricultural heritage and and that doesn't mean not develop at all that just means keeping in mind that that we need to a certain look and a feel to, to everything that happens here so that we can uh maintain the the uniqueness of Santa Cruz City. I agree. And I think going with that general plan review should be like a citywide kind of review of all the zoning as well. I think Brad, yep, it, you, it will you've, be. you've expressed some you know problems with other areas towards the core of town. So I'm with that. I think Trevor and I have been here since the last time we did the general plan. And um I put some significant effort into giving advice on what I'd like to see in the general plan and it was never applied. So um, I think we just have to make the best with what we have and act as like a chameleon. And like Brad said, make the best planning decisions moving forward that we can. And that includes infrastructure. So I, I do agree with you, if you're gonna rezone, maybe we need to look the entire area over and look at the infrastructure out there. I don't know. Kelly, um, Commissioner Adcock would like to comment. Thanks, Trevor. I uh, agree with and support the comments that have been made by Jessica and by Brad. Um, my biggest concern is that 35 acres is looking at a zoning map of the city is the last chance we have as unless we annex some some land someplace to do anything big or significant whether that's a hospital someday um a hotel um i don't know i, I don't think access is a problem as far as depth of the property but i don't think we should easily lose hold of uh, that amount of uh, commercial land without some really significant considerations. Thanks, Art. Okay, commissioners, is there, is there any other uh, thoughts or questions that you'd like to raise at this time? Okay, is anyone prepared to make a motion on the proposal? How does this part work again? What's the uh, actual motion for it? Don't we have to take a vote? Yeah, <laughs> yeah or nay? Yeah, so like I say, this this is your motion. This is a legislative action, so it's completely whatever you want it to be. But this is a recommendation to the city council. Um, and then the city council will take that recommendation and, and then it'll, it'll be their job to, to to look at all the information and to look at your recommendation and, and, and then, you know, make a legislative decision of whether or not this rezone is, is uh, takes place or not. So 
like like I say, this is this is this is the beauty of of uh, our government process. This is this would be changing a a a, a law, uh, which is our zoning map, and and so it is whatever what, whatever you want your motion and your recommendation to be. Commissioner Adcock. Thank you. Are we even in a position that we can make a recommendation at this time to the city council, or do we want to relook at this? broader picture of trying to do more planning and more zoning for that entire area. So we have a proposal that's before us and we owe the applicant a, um, a recommendation. We can make a recommendation either to forward, we can forward, we can make a positive recommendation or a negative recommendation essentially. Um, but I think we do need to make a recommendation. So to, to, to clarify that point, I think I think you want to act in a timely manner. You don't want to hold up an applicant forever. But again, this is a legislative action. So uh, you know, at some point, if the city council feels like like the planning commission is is not acting in a timely manner, they could they could have this on their agenda and move forward with 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 their decision. But yeah, to, to Art's point, like I say, you can do this is your recommendation. If you guys want to take more time, you could take more time. But uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that. That you would hold this up forever. Not that I'm saying your 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 intention is to do that, but like I say, this this is your your uh, your recommendation, and and uh, you know whatever that that the motion is going to be made, it's going to depend on on how you guys vote. I'm in the minor minority, so I'm sure you don't want me to make the recommendation. However, I will put this out there. If Michelle was here from our previous conversation, I think she'd be in favor for the rezone. So I wonder if we put this in the hands of our elected officials, if it would be a tie, if there was six of us, maybe we should just let them decide. Well, my understanding, if Jason and Ben are correct in how they interpret the code is no matter what recommendation we make, it still goes to the city council. I'm not sure that's how I read the code, but so no, we need to make a neutral, a neutral recommendation, maybe. Well, I mean, a neutral recommendation is not going to not going to help the city council at all. It's going to be kind of just punting the ball to them. But like I say, it's it's going to come down to what the motion is and then how you vote. And I think I think uh, city council members they don't just look at at the number of votes. They look at who voted and and maybe why they voted the way they did. So, um, yeah, this is. Yeah. This is going to be the, the city's the city council's discretion. Okay, so can I try this motion thing, uh, Trevor? You can correct me if I do it wrong again. <laughs> so Go I'd ahead. Like to make a motion that we uh, submit a positive recommendation to the city council on a uh, rezone to R10 PUD, contingent upon a development agreement being completed. I'll second. Thank you. And thanks for the second. So we have a motion and a second. Um, let's vote on the motion. Commissioner Wood, nay. Commissioner Curtis? Yay. Commissioner Lance? Yay. Commissioner Gunnell? Nay. Commissioner Tolman? Nay. Commissioner Adcock? Nay. So that motion failed with four votes against and two votes for. So we need to continue the discussion and come up with another motion. I mean, I can make basically the opposite motion um, based on that vote. Um, so with that, I make a motion that we forward to city council a negative recommendation against the proposed rezone of the Melhoff property from C1 to R10 with a PUD overlay. Thank you for that. Um, before asking for a second, Commissioner Adcock has asked for the ability to come. I was just going to second the motion. Very good. We have a second. So uh, let's vote. Commissioner Adcock. Aye. Commissioner Tolman. Aye. Commissioner Gunnell. Aye. Commissioner Lance? Nay. Commissioner Curtis? Nay. Commissioner Wood? Aye. So that motion
passes with four votes uh, supporting and two votes against. So thanks everyone. Um, that was a very good discussion. Um, anything else we need to say, Jason, while we're here before we move on? No, I just, I guess I'd just say that, that with that recommendation, it's anticipated that this will move forward to the city council. Uh, the next city council meeting is, is next Tuesday, uh, April 21st. Um, obviously this is not the, the, the ideal way to do, to do public meetings, but, uh, if there's people that would like to comment on it, we would, we would, uh, encourage you to, to, to send your comments to uh, the, the Santa Quinn City email, uh, public comments at santaquin.org. Um, and then, or, or you can provide us with your phone number and, and we can call you during that meeting so, so that you can make your comment over the phone. So uh, that's the next step. This will be forwarded to the, the city council and we anticipate that it'll be on their next agenda next Tuesday. Okay, thank you. And thanks to the applicants as well. Again, we appreciate you being willing to come out and share your proposal with us and all the preparation that went into it. So with that said, we will move on to agenda item 6B. This is the Summit Ridge Towns Preliminary Plan. All right, so give me give me a second. We have the applicants uh, that would like to participate and, and with these, these development plans that, that we look at closely and, and, and go through, uh, it's gonna be easier for them to participate via Zoom. So let me, admit them to the meeting and make sure that that they are are there and so we have Nate from LEI um, we have Adam Loser with DR Horton and Curtis Levitt with DR Horton uh, can you guys hear us looks like maybe they're connecting the audio still So Nate and Curtis, it looks like there's a chance you might be in the same room, but you're both on uh, on the Zoom meeting. Is that right, Nate? And Nate, it looks like you're muted. So make sure you unmute yourself. We'll try this way. Can you hear us now? Yeah, we can hear you now. No feedback, are we good? So, yeah, and, and I think I think you guys sound good. I just see that that looks like maybe Curtis is on Zoom as well. If 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 he is, that's going to cause nothing but an echo. So, uh, but we can hear you fine. So maybe we can just proceed uh, as is. I'm just sitting across the table, six feet apart from me. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, haven't heard from Adam, but we have you guys, and and uh, uh, I'm on. okay, and we have Adam. So we'll we'll move forward. So. This is a proposed uh, preliminary plan. Let me go ahead and share my screen so you can, can see this. And I, I must say, I should apologize. The, the memo that I, I sent to the planning commissioners, I think I forgot to change the, the heading that was on the top of that memo. It still said concept plan. Uh, this is in fact a preliminary plan uh, for uh, the DR Horton, uh, the development called Summit Ridge Townhomes. Um, so this is in the, the planned community zone. It's within the Summit Ridge uh, development and will be subject to the, the Summit Ridge development agreement. I will talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, this project is uh, approximately 43.12 acres in size and the proposal is for 429 units, all of which are, are, are proposed to be townhomes. Um, this has moved through the, the concept phase. A uh, public hearing was held. Uh, DRC and, and Planning Commission have provided feedback on this development. Uh, now it's moving forward to the preliminary plan where a, a lot more review and um, detail will be provided about the development. Um, so uh, in this process, the Planning Commission, uh, I, sorry, I should take a test step back. The DRC has looked at this already and has provided a recommendation uh, that was provided on the, on the memo. Um, it was it was recommended by the DRC that it it uh, it move forward on the condition that the the Summit Ridge uh, development agreement be uh, complied with. 
Um, so I guess now's a good time to bring that up. Uh, there is uh, there is a second amendment to the Summit Ridge Development Agreement that has been proposed and has been approved by the city council. Uh, we're still working out the, the final uh, language, uh, legalese, and, and making sure that that, that agreement is, is uh, signed and executed. But the, uh, the gist of, of what's been uh, addressed in that second amendment to the Summit Ridge Development Agreement is regarding open space. So with the current proposal, and sorry, I might have, there we go. Everybody see the, the plans now? So with the, the proposal, uh, if you remember, there was a, a handful of, of, of uh, areas of open space, um, but as part of their, their, um, their proposal, all this open space was, was proposed to be private open space. In, in the, the Summer Ridge Development Agreement, there is a requirement that they provide dedicated open space to the city uh, at the rate of of five acres per thousand residents. So when looking at that and trying to, to, uh, to work with them on this, this uh, development layout, uh, there were some things that needed to happen to, to, in order for this to, to work for them uh, and, and to have open space happen elsewhere in the development and, and have some tools in place so that if there was private open space that uh, there could be some credit given for that private open space, but you know still have open space uh, happen in different areas of Summit Ridge so that it was a, a well-balanced and, and well-planned community. So um, that, that document has is, is not been signed and executed yet. So uh, if the Planning Commission were to, to make a motion tonight, uh, very similar to what the DRC recommendation was, uh, we, would, we would suggest that it be on the condition that uh, that second amendment to the Summer Ridge Development Agreement be, be signed and executed. So, that's, that's kind of where we're at today. That's uh, hopefully a, a good enough um, introduction to you. Uh, I know that the, the applicants, they, they've sent me over a presentation and, and they would like to, to speak to, to their development and provide you with a little bit more detail uh, of their proposal. So, um, so Curtis, it sounds like you're, you're the one that's probably gonna do that. Let me, let me pull that up. So, uh, Curtis, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, there, there you go, Jason. First and foremost, just wanted to say it's great to join you folks. I'm sorry we're not there in person, but on behalf of DR Horton, we just want to say we are looking forward with much anticipation, and uh, we're we're definitely here for the long haul in Santa Quin. We're we've been working well with both the city staff. I think the the previous planning commissioner, city councilman. And uh, we're just excited to come in and continue to help build out communities that are going to stand tall in your community. It's something that the city is going to be proud of in the future, now and in the future. Um, as many of you know, we have a development up in the foothills that we're building right now, some single family detached homes there. And uh, we're building those community that, bu that building that community out, um, different floor plans, different looks, different uh, architecture, and it's, it's being received well by the general public. Um, one thing that DR Horton does is we actually go in with a lot of, um, we go through and actually make a thorough overview of the piece of ground that we're purchasing and we really lay it out and look at it and look at it from the perspective of what is this particular piece of ground going to lend itself both from a product offering also to the city if it's lying within the general plan, is it going to be something that's going to help benefit the city and also be a benefit to the general public. When we came forward to look at this uh, parcel of ground um, where it's abutting within the Summit Ridge development, this parcel of ground to the, it would be to the east, the, the southeast there, that piece of ground is a future commercial piece. Knowing that commercial is something that is something that is on the forefront, it is going to take place in Santa Quin, um, but knowing that to have rooftops to justify future um, commercial to come in play, it's also important to have those rooftops to justify that commercial that's gonna take place at some future point. Um, furthermore, with DR Horton, we have different product offerings that we have across the Wasatch Front. And when we laid this project out, 
we we really looked at it from the perspective of what can we offer to the product, what can we offer to the public from the perspective of different floor plans, livability, what type of buyer would be wanting to live in this community, and what type of amenities would they like to have within this community. So what we did is when we laid the, the, the project out, we looked at it and we, imp we brought in four different floor plans, of which they're all two-car garages. They're going to have anywhere square footage between 1,300 to 1,700 square feet finished with an unfinished basement. A majority of them will have basements. Um, so with that, um, let me just con – on the site plan you're looking at now, it looks very rudimentary and simple. And it, the reason it's, it is so, just to show you the green space, the pool, and some of those areas. Jason, if you wouldn't mind um, – let me let me go back quickly though before I, we've worked with the staff with Ben and with Norm and Jason in bringing some curvature to the roads and really putting a lot of thought and uh, really putting our best engineers on play on uh, on basically to work with us to make sure that we're not building a real linear project that's just simple cookie cutter rows of homes. So we tried to bring in so you've got a development that actually is going to have some character to it. So Jason, would you mind going to the next slide there? Um, we've kind of earmarked, that gives you an idea of the locations of the different amenities that we have within the community. We'll have an enhanced uh, entryway as you come into the community. And we're gonna have, there's gonna be a windmill and a tractor there as you come in. Um, I, knowing meeting with Jason and kind of this, the city's future, Jason, you have to help me, is an agritourism theme that Santa Quin City, you guys want to kind of have that within your vision of how you're portrayed to the general public. Is that correct? Is that the phrase you use? Yeah. So we thought in some of our other developments across the Wasatch Front, we, we have a big windmill we place in, and then we put a big tractor at the entrance of our communities. And I'll show you a picture of those just here momentarily. Um, furthermore, we do have a pool and a, a changing area, or restrooms for that matter. Um, for the residents there within Summit Ridge. We also are going to bring in a dog park. One thing that a lot of cities are finding in townhome attached product, a lot of residents want to have a pet, one or two pets, depending on the CCNRs and the city ordinances, but there's not an area to take your pet to let them run around and so forth. So we've had success in laying out areas for a dog, a dog park. And so we're going to place that there just past the entrance in there. And that's an area that will be fenced off. And it's going to have some, you know, it's very, it's fairly raw from the standpoint of it's going to have some, possibly some RCP pipe and some different type of aggregate rock and just kind of left for the dogs to run around there. Um, then coming back, a hammock grotto. We've had success with our communities also by putting up hammock grottos. People love just to go up and pull up a hammock and just to sit and relax and read. You'll be, it's interesting to find people actually do like to read. Unfortunately, my 14 year old son does not, but um, that's um, from that perspective, we also have um, to the right is a tot lot. So that kind of gives you an idea for some of the, the value we're trying to bring into the community, having done different um, surveys of our different buyers and trying to bring in the best value and what residents are really looking for in a community like this. Um, also, you'll see it in a future commercial there. Those buildings are not to scale. They're just asked as placeholders just to put there as a future commercial. Um, that's with the owner developer. That has nothing to do with us. But one thing we've done is we've actually taken into consideration the parking and pedestrian access points to, the, to that uh, future commercial area so that it has been planned out so that the residents there at some future point, when, it, when the commercial and if it comes online, they would have access to that area. Um, we could go to the next slide if you would be so kind, Jason. Um, these are some actual photos of our communities with some amenities. Uh, having said that, the dog park is not. We, um, that is a, a standalone photo, a stock photo of a dog park. Um, we have not built one at this point in time, but it would be similar from the standpoint of having, like I said, there's some, some pipe there and some rock and there's not gonna be water there. It's not gonna be standing water. Um, there you've got the, it calls out the type of fencing that's going to be surrounding the pool area as well as the dog park. Uh, bottom left hand side is the playground equipment. We're putting in uh, a price range that is going to be able to get a, uh, 
very similar. It's one of those four type of playgrounds. So it's not a little small piece of equipment. It's, it's adequate for this size of this development. The Terra Park, the, you can see where the foot tracks are and where all the kids are running through. Um, that is one of the most popular areas. The kids just love to go jump on rocks, play in the sand, go up and down the rope and so forth. So just uh, a real uh, great amenity for the kids. The Hammock Grotto we talked about, that's an actual photo at Mapleton, our development there. That would be a very similar pool and a restroom facility that would be built in this community. And then I mentioned that's a tractor that's uh, one of our communities in Saratoga Springs, and then a windmill that's in Mapleton. So that is the look and feel of the amenities that we'll be putting in this community. Um, with the R. Horton, we, we have gone through these communities across the Wasatch Front once again, and uh, have had great success with residents liking these and enjoying these different amenities. So um, with that being said, that kind of gives you an overview and a feel for the community. I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have at this point. You Maybe want to Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I should have gone to the next slide. I got out of myself. I need a drink of water. Um, Jason, thank you so much for the next slide. The previous, uh, that slide there is actually the phasing plan. Um, one thing you'll notice is our first phase is not necessarily too small. We are doing the loop road. It is all in red there. That's to give us two access points. Um, so with that being said, we will uh, be doing the pool uh, at the same time and the other amenities there too. It looks like the, the Terra Park as well. So that's the phasing plan. You can glance through. You can see we um, have phased that out and have planned accordingly with our engineer how we'll be uh, developing the, the community. And then we can go to the next slide, Jason. These are actual photos of developments and townhomes of the floor plans we'd be building. Um, the, the color palettes and actually the actual colors that we've submitted to and have been approved through ARC may not be indicative of these particular colors per se, but that gives you an idea of the two different style, both a craftsman and a farm style home. Um, you can see from architectural standpoint, beautiful, uh, the architecture really pops. It just, it does, it's just not uh, a cookie cutter looking townhome. We have different types of architecture that it's just real pleasing to the eye. So board and batten, lap siding, and the previous slide before Jason sent it was an alley loaded product. Some of the product here is allowed as an alley loaded product. So it's a rear loaded townhome. And there are all two car garages. And the next slide is gonna be a traditional townhome with a, a little backyard of limited common use for the townhome owner to have use of. And that's the, uh, the actual photos of floor plans. And Jason, I believe that is the last slide. That's, that's the last slide. Thank you. <laughs> hey, thank you for that presentation. Um, commissioners, maybe while you're thinking of uh, questions you'd like to pose, uh, Jason, would you for us um, just talk us through the process? So this is a preliminary plan review. Um, we're making a recommendation to the city council. This is um, a legislative or sorry, an administrative action. So we're our primary uh, responsibility is to make sure that this proposal complies with city code and the development agreement. Um, but maybe just talk us through how the process goes from this point forward. Yeah, I mean, you, you pretty much summed it up right there that this will be taking off the, the, the legislative hat of uh, uh, where the Planning Commission makes a recommendation to the City Council for a legislative purpose. Uh, this is this is an administrative action. So uh, like you say, this is this is ensuring that it's in uh, compliance with the code and, and, and with the Summit Ridge Development Agreement. Um, so, uh, this, this is a little bit different, uh, uh, approach than the, the last agenda item. So, uh, yeah, as we've gone through it, we've, we've, uh, the DRC has reviewed, uh, everything and, and they are, are pretty close to having everything addressed. There might be a few minor red lines here and there. Uh, but the, the big one was the open space. And, and when we addressed that with them at the DRC level, they, they, 
worked we've, we've been working the past two weeks to to get language for this this uh, second amendment and and they took it to the city council last week and and uh, uh that that second amendment was modified to to uh provide a little bit more more uh flexibility with how open space is is addressed in the uh in in this area uh as well as as the areas that are are owned by utah summit partners which is on the west side uh, of the of the train tracks, so the, the hills at Summer Ridge. This would apply to to that as well. So uh, basically, it's 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 um, defining different types of open space. Instead of it all being fee dedicated open space to the city, there could be private open space, but they they wouldn't get full credit for that private open space. Uh, the reason why that that was done is is because there are are pros and cons to different types of open space. Obviously. Uh, public dedicated open space is 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 wonderful because the entire community has access to their open space and, and can use that. Uh, however, uh, private open space uh, can be uh, a good thing to have because the city doesn't have to to maintain it and and uh, and take care of it, and it still provides uh, open space areas in the community. So uh, there's there's pros and cons to different types of open space. It was just um, providing uh, a little bit more clarity on, on those different types and, and credit that, that would be uh, provided for, for those uh, different types. So yeah, Trevor, you, you pretty much summed it up. This is an administrative action and, and uh, we'd be looking for, for the planning commission to, to make a recommendation to the city council. Okay, thanks. And just to clarify, um, we would not see this again after tonight. This is essentially the final time the planning commission would see this Proposal. Correct. So it would go forward to the city council. Uh, if they, they decided to approve that preliminary plan, then, then there would be a form of vesting at that point where, where they would have uh, that preliminary plan um, approved and in place for, for up to three years before it would expire. Uh, but from that point, then they would work on final plats, which would be taken to the DRC. And, and, and that's just an opportunity to, to make sure everything's been taken care of uh, and prepare, prepare it for a uh, recordation of the county. Uh, now, going back to, to the, the presentation that they did quickly, um, those final plats would be we done in phases. So uh, it wouldn't necessarily all be it done, done at once, but this is their anticipated phasing for the development. So phase one would be uh, that winding road. And, and, and the reason behind that is because they need the connectivity uh, the dual access in order to to make make this work and provide the the necessary access access for for public safety reasons. So uh, it's anticipated that they would follow the the phasing um, in, um, um, in 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 ordinal um, order. So phase one would be the red, phase two would be the orange, phase three would be this yellow pocket, phase four would be this green, five the the light blue and then the final phase would be uh in that purple correct okay thank you um commissioner tolman would like to comment um i had i have two questions that road on the west of the development is that going to be a road that the city can drive on mm -hmm. possibly yeah, to so access the soccer field at a later date or so that, that was something we, we worked closely with the developer on. Uh, as you guys know, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, there was an, an ordinance change that did not allow for, for private streets anymore in the city. And, and I won't go into the details of why we did that, but there was reasonings behind that because uh, uh, private streets just can complicate things, uh, especially if, if that private street is not maintained and it's vacated. If it's used by the public, uh, there's been case law that said that that uh, uh, that it is uh, would would be a public street because it's used by the general public and therefore the city would need to take it over and, and maintain it. So we want to avoid that. So that was done. However, because this is in Summit Ridge and because there is the development agreement that's been in place for for 20 years, uh, it was originally um, executed back in in uh, 2000 uh, with an amendment in. 2006, and then just the recent Second Amendment uh, uh, regarding open space, because that was was done before that ordinance amendment, uh, they have within the development agreement the ability to do some some uh, private roads. Now we've expressed our concerns about 
private roads, uh, the widths and, and who maintains what and whatnot. So they've been sensitive to that, uh, but they've still felt that in order to make their, their product work, uh, they've, they've suggested that they still have some private roads. So um, maybe let me go to the, the preliminary plan. Um, this will be easier to point out to you. Um, so these, these rear loaded units that they, uh, uh, they refer to, uh, for instance, this Oakdale Drive here, this Nettle Drive, um, even this Magnolia Drive, um, those would all be private roads. Those, those would be like a rear alley for access to the garages. Do you need um, to share yeah. your screen? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, let me do that again. So this Oakdale Drive that's on the, the, the west side of the development, uh, Nettle Drive here at the south part of it, uh, Magnolia, uh, there's a few little Bracken Drive, Loon Drive. These, these roads would be the private ones that would be like the rear alley access to, to the garages. Um, we, we've worked with them on, on the widths of that to, to make sure that it's, it's a, a good width for our public safety, uh, make sure that there's no infrastructure that are in those roads uh, in the event that that uh, uh, our public infrastructure needs to be replaced or, or uh, there's a leak or something that we're not uh, doing work inside a private uh, road or a, a private access. So uh, there is some private roads in here, but that's a little context of, of why that's there and, and what we work with them on. So, sorry, Jessica, to, to specifically address your, your question, this road on the east side, and we, we've asked it to, to be named this, uh, the name before was Twister, but it's proposed to be called Harvest View Drive, which, as you can see, you can see the, the edge of, of one of our soccer fields, uh, which is the Harvest View Sports Complex. That is a, a public city road. Now, as part of this recent development agreement, one of the things that, that we did, uh, the city did, was, was um, work with the developer to make sure that the full width of that road would be done. Um, uh, up front, not necessarily up front for the entire development, but but this this beginning part, which uh, there is a property owner, uh, SAQ Properties, which you can see right here, uh, they would have half of the road um, be their responsibility. Uh, part of this this development agreement would uh, would would be to try and get the full width up front. Now there would be a, a connectors agreement for SAQ to develop their property. But at least we'd have that full width up front so that we had a good, uh, nice road that, that would be an important road for access to the, the new soccer complex. Um, moving north from there, the west side of the road is, is, would be uh, the responsibility of the city. And, and we've worked with them to, and that's something that would qualify for uh, reimbursement. Uh, if they were to put that in, the city could reimburse them for the construction of that road. Uh, Jason, can I, can I interrupt you? Yeah, go ahead. On, on that. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I, I just want to clarify um, the terms of the Second Amendment, which is, has been worked out with the developer at this point. In fact, um, because of all of the eight acres of, of uh, improved park and open space within, which will be in, uh, installed by the developer and maintained by the HOA, they only get 80% credit. That 20% um, uh, has to be put in with um, improvements coming out outside of the development. And um, let me just specify the phased approach. The um, phase one, by the time that phase one is complete, and phase one is the connection of this road up and through and down. So phase one does not include Harvest View Drive. Um, phase one is out here. But by the time that phase one, oh, I'm sitting here moving my mouse and I am thinking you're seeing it. Um, phase one is uh, going down Fox Run Avenue all the way down around uh, uh, to the east. This, this um, is that is phase one. Oh, there you go, the red. And so with phase one, they will, by the time that phase one is complete, they would be installing additional road base uh, to add parking and installing a playground into the soccer complex. But in harmony with the orange phase, the yellow phase, and the green phase, as that road goes in, typically the developer would be responsible for half the road plus 10 feet. However, 
they, because of um, the only 20% credit, they are actually putting in the entire road um, and they're doing it in harmony with, meaning that the orange phase will go in when the orange phase goes in phase two, the yellow with the, with the yellow and the green. Um, and they will be completing the entire road as part of their development. That satisfies um, the 20% and, um, and, and the time frame would be phase two, phase three, or phase two, three, and four. Um, it wouldn't be coming in upfront. However, um, SAQ would have to have a reimbursement um, agreement with, um, with the city when and if they develop so that they pay their equal and fair proportionate half of the road reimbursing uh, the developer but since he's putting in the entire uh, road up front or in con conjunction with his development. And so did, you say, sure timing. did you say that they're putting in a playground in the soccer complex? That is part of this uh, uh, agreement that has been worked out with Santa Quint City because, because of the park having only an 80% credit. And the reason it's an 80% credit is because it's a private park. That means the entire community can't come out to enjoy it. It was installed by the development for that de or the developer for that development and maintained by the HOA. And so since the entire community does not benefit, they don't get 100% credit. But to create value for the remainder of the community and to create value that's uh, co-located to this development, what was negotiated is that they would be putting in the playground and they would be putting in the uh, uh, additional parking, uh, additional road base for parking um, so that more cars could, would, could enjoy that soccer complex as it stands today. Yes. Can I make one more? Uh, so one more question. Is there a way that we could restrict parking along the Harvest View Drive? Because I envision all the people that live in those units parking out front and then people parking at soccer games or football games parking along that same road. Um, so we um, obviously that road is not coming in right off the bat. It's going to be a ways out there, but it's not a narrow road. It's a wider road because it is a collector street. And so it's envisioned that it would be wide enough to be able to support parallel parking on, on that one side without adversely affecting um, the, uh, uh, the, the ability to, to traverse that road or the ability to have parking on the other side of the road for the soccer complex. Um, but with that said, that's their, their entrance into those units would come from the east, not from the west, um, although their front doors would front it and Obviously, they may want to park out front as well. Thanks, Ben. So, Jason, you were you wanted to? Yeah, can you thanks for chiming in, Ben. That that was explained better than I was I was going with it. So, what I meant is is in conjunction with the the different phases, the the orange phase, the yellow phase, the green phase, the full width of the road would be done up front with those phases rather than a half plus ten. So, so to, to back to Jessica's original question. That would be a city road, and and as part of that that newly adopted development agreement, we would have uh, the full width of that road as this development moves forward. Uh, like Ben mentioned, the other things is the playground, uh, additional road base, and all of that uh, is is to to make up for the shortfall in the the open space uh, credit that they would get for the private open space that they're they're providing. So uh, those details have all been worked out. Uh, it's like I say, it hasn't been signed and executed yet. Uh, we would we would uh, suggest that you, that if you do make a recommendation tonight that you make it subject to to that being uh, approved. But um, yeah, sorry, that was a, a very long answer to your question. But there's there's a lot of context and history, uh, recent history that that goes into understanding this development. Thanks. Jason. Okay, um, I think Commissioner Gunnell was next. So Jessica hit the question I was going to ask about the road on the west. I was also going to ask um, how attached the developer is to the name Ute Drive. I didn't know if that was named because there's a streak of about 10 homes on one side to zero homes on the other. Or why that was. The Ute Drive. I told them not to use Ute Drive, my engineer. I apologize. Um, <laughs> We can look at that. Oh, I was just being facetious. I was trying to come up with something because Jessica took my point. We've been giving them a hard time, hard time on on names of roads this whole process. They've already changed uh, five or six road names, so uh, you're not alone <laughs> in, in some of your feelings, Brad. 
um, planning commissioners. I wanted to make mention quickly something, uh, Ben and Jason, for uh, uh, Commissioner Tolman, her question about parking. On the engineer plans that we had from DRC, from Norm, he's asked that we actually have both sides of the road, um, no red painted curbing and no parking signs required on both sides of the roadway on Harvest View Drive. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Um, okay. I think Commissioner Lance was next. Well, I guess um, I think we're all a little bit nervous about having this large of a development of townhomes. So I guess my concern is just that a majority of these are gonna be owner occupant or, um, yeah, mm -hmm. the owner's gonna live in them. They all will be. Well, yeah, no, they're, they're owner occupant, of course, under state law and state statute, if a home or a homeowner, we have we have guidelines in our CCNRs, obviously for rentals, and what you know if you do rent it out, and there's guidelines that from FHA guidelines what you can and can't do from renting your homes. Yeah, sorry, just to clarify what it's I meant. Self sorry, Nate or uh, Curtis, what I meant by that was they will all be separately platted units. So yes, yeah, maybe not necessarily owner occupied because like any single family home in the city, someone could rent their house out. Right. But uh, yeah, I think what you might mean by owner occupied it was, is these are not rentals. They, they are well, all- I guess I just wanted to make sure it was an FHA approved development so that it was mostly owner occupied. I, so he answered my question. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Curtis. Yeah, Brad, you probably, uh... Or Commissioner Gunnell, sorry, you probably know the city code better than the rest of the commissioners, maybe. Um, is there anything in there that we can find to restrict this <laughs> development? Because I, I know offense to you, Curtis, or DR Horton, or anything like that. I, uh, but, and I love how you say, you know, that this is something that the city is going to like and, you know, bring, you know, be nice for the city, but. I don't know of a single person, obviously I don't know everybody in the city, but I don't know of a single person that is looking forward to this coming in at all. I mean, obviously we just had the whole discussion on the other residential unit and this is just, you know, so much more dense and way less open space and just tons and tons of homes uh, squashed in. Yes, right. I understand that. I, I guess what I should explain a little bit better for you is from DR Horn's perspective on a product offering, we're really trying to lend itself from a first time home buyer or an affordable product up to our homes in the foothills where they may be four or $500,000 and getting a broad range of different product offerings within the city. Um, myself getting started and getting married, my first home was a two bedroom, two bath condominium on a bottom floor in Orem across from UVU. That's all I could afford and that's what I could get my first home, uh, what I could actually afford at the time. So I think one thing that we we're just happy to bring to the forefront and, and I understand where you're coming from as well. Is, you know, you say that there's some people that don't want this. Having said that, there are also some residents, for example, um, moms and dads want to have their kids stay around and to have their first home within Santa Quinn to live there. Or grandma and grandpa to have their grandkids live there and continue to be raised in Santa Quinn City. And we're going to be in a price range between 240 to 260 within that price range. So it's going to be an affordable product. It's going to be an affordable home. And it's going to be something um, you know, with today in real estate, it's, it's hard to find anything that's newly constructed in that price range across the Wasatch Front. Yeah, so Cody, to your question on these, you know, where there's a development agreement in place and all of this, I, I've looked at these in the past trying to find, you know, some way for us to, you know, slow down the pace of high density housing coming into town. Um, there's just not that much we can do where they have vested property rights for on top of that, they have a contractual arrangement. And we're just kind of limited at this point to saying, okay, does it comply? And trying to build a good relationship. So when we maybe make requests that are a little bit beyond what code requires, that maybe the developer will throw us a bone and you know try and help our community. But yeah, to a certain degree, our hands are tied here. Um, I understand this is yeah, right on your back step. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I was. I knew it was a long shot, but I figured I'd get. Uh, I'd ask. This is the exact location that I hit golf balls off my backyard, uh, right onto the, exactly where this is going. So, 
I'm not looking forward to it one bit because I just think it's way too dense and there's not nearly enough open space. I think there's just way too many homes on top of each other. I appreciate having affordable homes. That's great, Curtis. I get what you're saying there. It's just, I don't think we need 424. But. To that point, I just want to say that um, we rely heavily on staff, especially in cases like this where there is a development agreement in place that we maybe haven't you know, reviewed with a fine tooth comb. And so I think you stated, but maybe you could reiterate whether or not there were any problems with the proposal in light of the development agreement or the existing city ordinances. Yeah, like I say, uh, the, the, the big one that needed to be addressed was the open space uh, dedication requirement in the development agreement. Um, I think, yeah, th that development agreement has been in place before all of our times. Um, um, 2000 was when it was first executed. And, and so we're, we're all uh, needing to, to live with, with the agreement that's been made. So we're, we're, I, think, I think Brad put it well on that, you know, let's, let's do our best to, to work with the developer and try and find ways to, to make, make the development better. As, as Curtis indicated, the, the first pr proposal, we, we, we called it the barracks because it was just a grid system of just homes uh, lined up and and uh, they had a, a big central park area that was a, a big circle, but uh, we worked with them to try and make this development better. Uh, I guess the, the silver lining, if you will, with the, the development agreement for, for those in Summit Ridge is, is that uh, there is a, a maximum of, uh, of, of 2,600 units that could be done in Summit Ridge. That was, that was a men, or see, it originally came in 2000 to be 3,200 units, but then in the 2006 amendment, it was modified to allow for a total of 2,600 units. Um, and, and so this, this is, a, this is a, a good chunk of, of units that is gonna be uh, you know, used up, if you will, uh, 429 units. So um, the, the more units that are here, that means the, the less units that, that will, will be elsewhere in the development. Um, now, like we've, we've talked about on the, the last agenda item, uh, 20 years ago, it was, it was a completely different time and, and, uh, and, and the development agreement, there's a lot of things that, that, that is, is challenging and we find difficult, but we have to work with it. And that's why there's been the 2006 amendment. That's why there's been this recent amendment. So uh, we're trying to work with what we have and, and uh, there's, there's things in the future that, that might be able to uh, be addressed further and, and, and or changed uh, to, to be what's best for Santa Clinton City. Now, if, if I, I don't know this question. I'm sorry, if I, if I could just jump in really quick on that as well. Jason explained that really well. Um, and, and with the total number of units and, and these units on the east side, it really does uh, benefit the overall development. But it's also, I think, going to uh, Commissioner Gunnell's point earlier in the last discussion, um, it goes to the findings of that. Um, one of the issues with regard to high density and the consideration of high density that the city council and I know the planning commission has been grappling with are when does it make sense to have high density? Uh, this is really uh, Summit Ridge's uh, one up at bat really with, with regard to the high density in the 2,600 homes um, that it could have. But does this uh, reside close to a uh, freeway ent entrance? Yes, it does. Does it follow um, uh, um, near what could be a future UTA route? It, it does. Um, would it uh, be conjoined with or surround a, com a commercial development? And, and I recognize that uh, DR is not part of the commercial in the area in the blue, and therefore it would be um, you know, inappropriate for them to show the layout of the blue area. But the, the, some of the proposed looks at that um, blue area really do show a, a great commercial base for our community for which this would provide a synergistic use. Um, and so when you look at it from a, a larger perspective of does it drive our commercial base? Is it, is it uh, very impactful to the core area of town? Um, you know, one of the, the items that came out during high density discussions during the election was the high density should be closer to the south exit. It, it does support all of those things. And and in fairness to uh, to Dr. Horton, I think this is probably their third or fourth iteration. Um, they, I think they inherited the first one, and and they've just improved on it each and every time since, um, and and have really done uh, quite a bit to bring it to where it is today for your consideration. 
it is contractual. And so this is one of the issues that we've inherited. But I think, um, again, going back to Commissioner Gunnell's um, um, comment, um, on many cases now, we, we've brought issues to DR and they have made improvements um, uh, specific to this development um, when in some cases they may not have been required to. I think in fairness to them, they, they've tried to make it a really good uh, product, uh, but still fit to the high density um, needs of their corporate objective and the terms of the development agreement for which they've, they've uh, are operating. So I'll be quiet. Thanks, Ben. Um, Kylie, did you want to jump in? I just was going to ask if they could make that a McCormick tractor instead of a John Deere. <laughs> McCormick. <laughs> I uh, would have to find out who were, I, I don't know much about tractors, uh, Commissioner, but I can make a note of that. <laughs> I also want to say that I, I do appreciate DR Horton and I think that they are really improving our community and I do think that they build a quality product. Um, I think Thank the only you. thing that this is really missing is just the private space that the last one had. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Gunnell. Yeah, um, just I don't know if this question is better for Jason and Ben or for the developer, but is it possible in CCNRs to limit the percentage of units that can be non-owner occupied at a given time? Um, you know, say no more than 30% can be a rental at any given time. I know the Summit Ridge development already has CCNRs recorded against the entire development. I'm not sure about an added layer of CCNRs. There probably would be with this because there would be an added layer of homeowner, uh, homeowners association. Um, but typically the city doesn't uh, get involved in the, the CCNRs beyond what was approved in the development agreement. And certainly we don't enforce CCNRs. Uh, that would be the purview of the HOA, but certainly something we can we can uh, visit with and, and talk about and negotiate. Great. Yeah, I don't know, Nate, if you can weigh in on that. I, I understand it's probably too late for this development, but just looking to the future as these you know, proposals come forward on how we can keep our residents happy or assuage those kinds of fears that come up. Good point. So if I may just kind of reiterate, so the Federal Housing Administration, their financing does require, if the community um, is FHA approved, it has to be a certain percentage owner occupied. I don't know exactly what the percentage is, but I want to say like 65. And so if they don't, don't meet, that, if they don't <clears throat> meet the threshold, then they, nobody could get that type of loan in this community. And so it is something that's really desirable to maintain. Can I ask one more question, Curtis or Nate? I don't know if you have an answer. Sure. When would, I mean, obviously, if everything goes as planned, when would you're expecting uh, groundbreaking or construction on phase one be? You'll probably see some horizontal improvements um, depending on how things go with final plat, but probably towards the end of May in June to start seeing some roads cut and start seeing some, some of the offside, just some of the on site improvements. I was just wondering if I had enough time to sell my house, but it doesn't sound like it. So, <laughs> just kidding. No, we have plenty of time to go pick up your golf balls. <laughs> good, good, good point. Good point. Okay, commissioners, any other thoughts or questions or concerns? If not, is anyone prepared to make a motion? Jason, there was one contingency that you had suggested uh, for this motion that it'd be contingent on an amendment beginning to or something else. I didn't write yeah. that down. I'm pulling over uh, the memo. Uh, so our recommendation uh, was was that uh, the the preliminary plan uh, be recommended for approval, uh, with the the condition that the plans are in compliance with the Summit Ridge Development Agreement, um, and that red lines be addressed. There's still a, a few red lines, uh, more engineering related, but uh, yeah, that those would be the conditions that we would recommend for the Planning Commission. 
as well as the execution of the second amendment to that development agreement. Thank you, Ben. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, I can try and make that motion. Um, I'll make a motion that we recommend approval of the Summit Ridge townhomes with the following conditions that the Second Amendment to the Summit Ridge Development Agreement be executed, that the plans are in compliance with the Summit Ridge Development Agreement as amended, and that all red lines be addressed. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a, excuse me, we have a motion and a second. Um, let's go ahead and vote. Commissioner Edcock. Aye. Commissioner Tolman. Aye. Commissioner Gunnell. Aye. Commissioner Lance. Aye. Commissioner Curtis. Can we vote not here? We can't, right? So, aye. And Commissioner Wood, aye. That motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Appreciate your time. Thank you for your time. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. We'll see you again. Thank you so much. Okay. With that, let's move on to agenda item 6C. This is a conditional use permit request with regard to queuing. All right. So this, this should be uh, somewhat familiar uh, to the uh, planning commissioners, at the, at the last meeting, there was a proposed ordinance amendment that uh, uh, changed the code related to car washes. Uh, one of those changes was in relation to uh, a, an opportunity for an applicant to, to obtain a conditional use permit for, for queuing. Um, so let me pull up. I, I've been working with the applicants on this, and, and they've been uh, refining their their uh, their, their proposed site plan for for their car wash and I apologize give me a second while I I pull that up and then let me share my screen with you so you can see what I'm looking at. All right, can you see, see a plan? Okay, so uh, those are some, some uh, vertical renderings of, of the building. So here with the site plan and, and for purposes of this agenda item uh, for queuing, uh, this is the uh, property located at 315 East Main Street. Um, it's, this building is sat vacant on and off. Uh, most recently, there was a diesel mechanic shop that was in that building. Um, and way back when, when it was originally built, it was a car wash at one time uh, with, with a, uh, a automotive related businesses, a lube shop and, and things of that nature. So uh, these applicants, uh, Josh and Brianna Nixon, they have picked they're under contract to pick up this property and, and they would like to to use it for what it was originally built for and that is a car wash and and a, a loop shop um, but the recent changes and clarifications that have been made in the ordinance ordinance related to car washes uh, they 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 would be able to do that but the one thing that they've uh, that's been the the issue that's that's not allowed them to move forward is queuing um, you know, this building was built years ago and was used as a car wash, but, but since that time, uh, there's been language put in the code that referred to uh, queuing not being between the building and a public street. Um, if I pull up the memo, uh, th this language, which I'll highlight for you, was, was recently adopted by the city council with a recommendation from the planning commission uh, which allows them to get a conditional use permit for queuing contrary to the, the provisions that are, are in our current code. Um, now it, it does require that, that uh, they do not conflict with the use of required parking stalls, uh, that it, it meets fire code, building code, uh, and that it does not result in queuing in any way that would, would block 
the public street or interfere with public rights of way. So going back to their site plan, uh, they've, they've shown and indicated that they are able to, for these two bays, queue with, with two guards deep uh, before they enter those bays. Uh, they did uh, talk about this bay being um, reactivated, if you will. It's, it's, it's been blocked off, but it was a bay at one point and has the, the uh, or is, is close to having the infrastructure in place to make it a, a car wash bay. So there potentially could be uh, some cars uh, queuing there as well. Now, the reason why the, the code was changed the way it was is, is if, if there becomes a problem where queuing is spilling out into the right of way or, or stacking up on the street, that we could revoke that conditional use permit. And you know, then they would be in a situation where they wouldn't be able to operate. So it's, it's really putting, putting the responsibility on them to make sure that there aren't those negative impacts from, from their business operations and specifically those queuing lanes. So uh, with that said, um, this is a, a proposed uh, conditional use permit, which, which would be uh, approved by the planning commission. And, um, and, and if they get that, they would be able to move forward with the site plan and, and, and be able to queue in the way that is shown on, on this, this uh, plan that is on your screen. Thanks for that introduction. Um, Commissioner Adcock, did you want to comment? Yes, thank you. Two points. What, number one, with the change in queuing, will they still have adequate parking because they're going to interfere with the parking in front? And the other point is, will the applicant be adversely affected when Main Street is widened? Good, great question. So this portion of Main Street has already been widened. You, you can tell because they have the, the planner boxes. Uh, I think, uh, if I remember right, there. Uh, Maybe the right turn lane is is before this business, but but nonetheless they have the the necessary width to to that there's not going to be any more more um, infrastructure improvements to their frontage. Um, so, and, and then uh, your other question, yeah, there there's still things with the site plan that need to be addressed. This isn't uh, you know going to be approved and, and starting tomorrow. There's there's some things that they're proposing on this this uh, site that are still gonna to need to go through a building permit process and a, a site plan review process. We're working closely with them to make sure that they meet the, the parking requirements. They're, they're changing things up a little bit. On the, the west side of the building, they would have a little, um, um, uh, what's the word? The, the, the room for, for all of their, uh, like a utility room. Um, and then they would have a, a dog wash where, where People could take their pets and, and have these enclosed areas where where it's it's a little easier to wash your pets. So there's things that they're proposing to add to this, and as we work with them on that, we'll make sure that that all the site improvements are are going to be met. Um, but for purposes of tonight, for tonight, it's just the the conditional use permit for the queuing. All the other things come in conjunction with with them turning in a proposed business license and us reviewing uh, the the appropriate use on this this property. So. Uh, those things have not yet been fully addressed, and we're still working with them to make sure that those things are, are adequately addressed. Thank you. Um, so a question. Um, you explained very well that the conditional use permit allows the city to enforce uh, those requirements, that, that the queued cars couldn't spill out onto Main Street. Um, but it becomes an enforcement issue. And so my primary concern is what happens when those queued cars do spill out onto Main Street, um, which we know may happen, right? I mean, it's it's up to them to make sure it doesn't happen, but obviously there's only so much they can do and there is the possibility that cars will spill out. Um, maybe, well, I guess maybe the question is, did they consider having the cars line up and come into the car wash from the north? It seems like there would be a little bit more space there for additional cars without the potential for spilling out onto Main Street. Yeah, so that that was definitely something that we looked at. That, that's this has always been our, our biggest concern. Um, and we we went out and met with them on site and got the tape measure out and 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 looked at the the option of them uh, coming in the the car wash from the rear and then leaving from the the uh, the Main Street side of of those bays. Uh, the, the radius that they have there just isn't going to work for them for, for larger vehicles. It would be really hard for them to make that radius uh, to turn in. Plus, as, as you have cars queuing there, 
it 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 inhibits the the flow of of these other bays being used and it just it, it didn't work for them and so this would this was the alternative route uh to take and and to speak to your points about enforcement and and uh is a very appreciative uh a point made uh enforcement is always the most difficult thing with with uh anything uh in in, in the city uh, we, we have these codes in place, but but enforcement of them sometimes is, is the most difficult thing. The thing with this particular project is, is if queuing does happen out in, in Main Street, it, it will be noticed right away. It's it's going to be pretty impactful. And so uh, if, if it causes problems, then it would be something that that we would know of right away and, and it'd be something that we can address. Um, and like I say, that the conditional use permit will make enforcement uh, much easier. Have they given any indication how they would um, enforce that? Uh, they haven't gone into details yet. They they know that it's going to be their responsibility. Uh, they have these pay stations here, and and they've they've looked at a lot of uh, uh, you know really uh, advanced auto um, automotive ways of moving people through really quickly. Uh, it's not going to be uh, just a you know line up and sit forever and wait for for cars. It's it's that their their uh, uh, their uh, strategy is to get cars moving as fast as possible, and and so with those pay stations and with with the the things the technology they're going to be using, that's that's their their plan is to move cars through there as fast as possible, so that people aren't having to wait in that those queuing lanes for very long. Okay, thanks, um, Brad. You wanted to come in. Yeah, so just so I'm understanding the proposal here, right? This is the type of car wash where you pull in and the brushes and the sprayer move around the car, correct? It's not like the tractor system, like a supersonic. Well, and 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 speaking with them, they've been they've been very uh, clear and and uh, that they're they're not planning on using any of the brushes. This would just be uh, the use of of water being sprayed. Uh, yeah. They they have they've got very strong feelings about uh, certain car washes and and those brushes sometimes can cause damage to cars and scratches and and whatnot. So they take a lot of pride in in what they're doing. Uh, I think they've got uh, family that is in this business, so they they've got uh, uh, some expertise uh, close by that they can they can uh, make this work and and uh, do it in a way that's that's going to be a a good quality business, but it's also going to move cars through uh, at a, a fast rate. Yeah, and the reason I ask that question is just trying to visualize the pace of how fast cars might move through the queue. The other question, um, do you know if they're going to be pursuing, say, an agreement with Holiday to sell car washes from the pumps? I, I, I'm not, no, they have not indicated anything that, uh, to that extent. The only thing that they're, they're planning on doing is, is the east side of the building, those three bays. Uh, they're planning on leasing that space out to a lube type uh, uh, automotive use, uh, land use or, or, or business type. So uh, that's that's what they've uh, indicated. And like I say, we're still working with them on the, on the details of this site plan. Yeah. Yeah. Like I say, my questions are just, I'm trying to visualize how fast cars will be moving through or how they might stack up. Um, I generally in favor of this i i see the possibility of an enforcement issue in the future but i like to trust that people can work things out and you know behave in the way that souls are going to behave or that we can work it out if there's an issue in the future what do you think commissioners any other thoughts or questions Is anyone prepared to make a motion? Um, real fast, sorry, Trevor. Jason, Jason, I just got a message from one of the proponents just came through on my watch from Facebook. Uh, Brianna says, have Jason call us to answer these questions. Okay, and, and Brianna Nixon, she is, is one of the applicants. Uh, in coordinating with them, they, uh, uh, they didn't feel the need to necessarily participate uh, via Zoom. But they they did want to stand by if the planning commissioners had questions for them. But uh, based on on the the message that Brad just got, sounds like they would be interested to comment if that's all right with you, Chairman Wood. 
Yes, please, and thanks, Brad. Hi, Brianna, Jason Bond. Uh, Hi. We, we understand you, you messaged one of the planning commissioners and, and are interested in, in addressing the planning commission. We just wanted to answer the questions if they wanted to ask us any. And I should have just texted you. I was just hurrying that one out because we asked the questions. We wanted to answer that. Um, I can, let me hand it over to Josh though, because he, he can answer the specifics on the equipment and how quickly they can get cars through. Are you there? Yep. Oh, okay. Hi, Josh. How are you? Good, go ahead and, and, and talk. The planning commissioners can, can hear you over the Zoom meeting. Okay, so I just want to let you know that uh, we have the ability to add a third wash if chewing is a problem. Um, we didn't want to make it the best sense right now because we don't know, you know if it, it can support more than two washes. I hope, I hope it can, but um, yeah, we can't, we can't eliminate the ability for the loop side to be able to flow through um, and leave. That's why we have to come in from the front. So, so, so based on, on uh, seeing the commissioners on the screen, uh, it's a little, maybe a little bit hard for you to hear. Let me reiterate what he said. So uh, he mentioned that, that possibility of that third bay. Uh, they're not planning on doing that right now. But if, if business is, is really pumping and, and they, they have need for that third bay to, to provide more uh, service for, for customers, uh, that's, that's when they put that third bay to, to help um, provide more uh, space and, and, and quicker uh, wash times for, for people that want to use it. Um, they, they don't have much control over, over the, the, the lube shop bays, if you will. Uh, there's, it's not expected that there's going to be a, you know, a stacked line of people waiting to get uh, their, their car serviced in that way. But um, in, in terms of the car wash, that would be their, their approach to, to making sure that, uh, uh, or to address the, the queuing concerns uh, with those first two bays that they're planning to do now. Was there so, anything else more that you wanted to say, Josh? Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. So Josh is here, if you have any questions for him. So maybe I would follow up with the original question. Um, I know they have, don't have control over individual drivers. Um, we do see sometimes that there are places in town where lines do spill out onto Main Street. Um, and I'm just curious that they've thought through how they can encourage people to be good citizens and not spill out onto Main Street, whether it's through signage or other means to help you know, prevent people from doing that. Did you hear that, Josh? Part of it. Let, let me rephrase it for you. So uh, Chairman Wood was just asking, uh, we have situations in town right now where, where queuing spills out in, into the roadway. Uh, he was wondering what, what, uh, what things you're, you're, gonna, you're planning on doing or, or things that you can do to, to help um, your customers be, be good residents and, or good citizens and, and, and not queue out on the road. Are you, do you have plans to have signage or, or other things like that to, to help people help prevent people from queuing into the road? If it's a problem, yeah, we put signs up saying no more than, you know, two cars in line, but like we're, uh, we're involved with another wash that has even shorter space for cars to line up and people just come back when they have time. People, somebody wants to be in the road, they don't want to get an accident. If, if it is a problem, I mean, we'll open up the third day and well, these washes, I mean, they can still wash a car in four minutes. I mean, between two and a half and six and a half minutes, depending on the wash. But having all both of them running, I don't think there'll be a line if there's 
three for sure there won't be a line ever. But Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. In the beginning, you know, it might be you know, a lot of people might want to use it all at once, but I think after it's open for a few days and running, I think that um, things will calm down and then you'll get a flow. Okay, thank you, Josh. Yeah. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, fair enough. Is anyone prepared to make a motion? I think I still have the, the screen shared. Uh, there's a, a recommendation uh, up there if you'd like to use that. I'll go ahead and make the motion. Um, I don't have a lot of, <laughs> or we haven't had a lot of com comment one way or another. I don't know how it'll go, but I'll make it. Um, I'll make a motion that we approve a conditional use permit for queuing to happen between the classic car wash of Santa Quinn and Main Street. Okay, thanks. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay, very good. Let's vote. Commissioner Wood, aye. Commissioner Curtis. Aye. Commissioner Lance. Aye. Commissioner Gunnell? Aye. Commissioner Tolman? Aye. Commissioner Adcock? Aye. Okay, that uh, conditional use permit is approved unanimously. Thanks, everyone. And with that, we will move on to agenda item 6D. This is a parking reduction for an LPG tank at the grocery store. All right, so this is a, let's see. This was in my memo. Let me pull that, slide that over. Sorry, there's a lot of things to juggle in these Zoom meetings. Um, all right, so, um, you can see my screen there with the, the grocery store site plan on there. Okay, so uh, the project manager for the, the grocery store development uh, approached the city and, and uh, specifically for the ACE hardware, they would like to, to have a, um, an LPG tank. LPG stands for liquid propane uh, gas. Uh, they wanna have that service available for uh, uh, for their customers. And, and so they, they approached us and, and wanted to find a good location to have that. Um, this area uh, that I've indicated as the previously proposed location, they first came to us with that location. And, and the reason being is there's, there's a little bit of space there and, and they, they kind of did a little uh, bulb out, if you will, to, so people could pull over and, and have their, their trailer or, or, uh, whatever they, they needed to fill up right there close to it so they could uh, use that service. However, there was a number of concerns we had with that location. It's, it's right at the, the crux of, uh, or the crossroads of the parking area to the, the east of the store and, and the main parking area. And it just didn't seem like a great location uh, for that service. And, and you know, trailers, they, they showed the, the plan that shows how a 40 foot a vehicle or a, a, a truck with a 40 foot trailer uh, would pull in there and th they would have to back up to get into that little bulb out to, to access the area. So we've, we've coordinated with them and worked with them and, and discouraged them to not put it in the location, but to find a different location that would work better for, for them. And, and that would also work for the city. So they proposed to put the, the tank up here. Uh, it's a little bit more out of the way. Uh, and, and you can kind of see, it's kind of light. Let me see if I can zoom in and, and show you. Um, I can't remember what the technical term for it, for this is, but, but they can provide these plans that show what, uh, and, and I think in this case, it's a 40 foot trailer. You can see this, this vehicle and you can see those lines that that would indicate what 
space that vehicle would take up when it turns in, in that, that space. So the vehicle would turn here. Uh, when it makes a turn, it takes up a little bit more space and then it would come through here and then it would stop in this, this little area cut out where they would be in, in close proximity and, and, and could uh, use that service. And then they would pull out and, and come out of the development. So it's a, it's a much better place where they're not gonna have this S turning movement uh, it's it's going to be more of a straight shot with with minimal turns. Um, the only thing with this is is in order for them to put it in that location, they would need to take up three parking stalls. Now uh, the code requires that any reduction in parking be approved by the planning commission. Uh, if you remember, there was there was a reduction. Uh, it, it was a conditional reduction uh, for them to have an additional pad space um, for the it, here in the main. Um, parking lot area. I guess it, it could be up here on the side, but anyways, there was a parking reduction that, that uh, with conditional approval that was given to them. Um, so there's been parking reduced to this point, but this would be uh, a proposed uh, three ex extra spots that would make way for this, this LPG tank. Now, the last thing I'll say um, is, is in coordinating with them, one thing that, that uh, was clarified was all of their parking in this development is actually 10 foot wide parking spaces. Our, our code re requires that they, um, they have at least nine feet uh, uh, in width for parking spaces. So um, if, if the planning commission were to, to have an issue with, with three spaces being, being uh, occupied or, or taken away in this location, uh, they do have the flexibility where they could modify the, the parking spaces to be a little bit narrower and, and, and recoup uh, those three parking spaces uh, by narrowing all the other parking spaces. Uh, with that said, uh, I'll stop talking and, uh, and look to you for, for uh, your consideration of this parking reduction uh, to make way for, for this uh, thousand gallon LPG tank. Well, so not specifically related to the tank, but I think we would all appreciate the wider parking spaces um, I think that's a good move, and I think that's a fair trade-off for three of them. Do, do we have, I'm not familiar, do we have any other um, places in town that have an LPG uh, tank? Or? Uh, the uh, the a service good. station formerly known as Fast Tracks has one. Yeah, I, th I think Maverick might have one too um, in the, the very rear, that upper parking lot that they have, but I, I don't know for sure. There's a propane business out on the west end of town as well. Um, Commissioner Adcock, you wanted to come in. Yes, thank you. Yeah, there's one out west where the, <clears throat> the dump used to be. Um, <clears throat> by where the tank shown on the map there, there's some lines going uh, vertical and, and horizontal. I wonder what those are. And then I'm wondering what is <clears throat> what's on the north side of that road that be goes, goes behind the store? as far as a, a buffer, um, if that tank should blevy, it would be uh, quite a mess. So the, the lines that you're, you're referring to, that is a, a, a retention basin uh, that would, would take care of extra stormwater on the site. They, they have a requirement to retain all the stormwater on site. And so that retention basin uh, is in that location to, to serve that purpose. Uh, the area to the north, if you remember, was the, the uh, um, the, the higher density development that, that went through the, the rezone process and, and, and was approved. They have not come through the process yet, but they, they do have that uh, uh, rezoning for, for them to do uh, those, that high density uh, development there. In the, in the, the plan that the, the, the city liked the best, there was a, a connection point uh, to have connectivity between that development and the grocery store development. And that would be somewhere in this vicinity. So um, it's anticipated that there's, there's going to be a, a block wall that'll that'll buffer between the grocery store development and 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 that higher density residential as well. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gunnell. Yeah, so this tank it's going to be a, basically a point of sale. Like people will pull up to this tank to have their smaller tanks filled. Is that correct? Correct, and it's my understanding that that they would need uh, uh, an Ace Hardware employee to go out there and, and help them with that. Uh, that's that's partly why they wanted to have it close there. But 
they they felt like this would be a great location as well where it's visible uh they're not going to be blocked by the retention basin it's that's going to be uh, you know more of a, a pit if you will but it's it's still in a spot where it's it's visible but but they can have uh an employee go out and, and help help the the customer with with uh using that lpgd tank to, to fill up their own yeah i just wanted to make sure that you know the next parking you know, space there to the south wasn't going to get painted out as, you know, do not use because of proximity or keeping it open to you know, someone to pull their pickup up with a tank in the back. Um, that said, as long as no other spots are going to get painted out, you know, as long as what we're looking at is what's going to happen, I'm okay with it because in my experience, that's where people abandon cars, not where they park cars necessarily. And and I should mention too that this is this is something that we've we've taken uh, we've we've run by the uh, the building official and the fire chief and and others. If you look really closely, there's these little dots around it. Those are all bollards to to help protect it from from anybody, you know, running into it or or you know hopping over the curb. Uh, obviously, that's a a, a concern. But uh, yeah, so th this is this has been looked at by other departments to to uh, make sure that it meets their, their uh, addresses their concerns and meets their requirements. All right, can I make a motion? Please do. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the um, reduction, three stall parking reduction for the LPG tank. I'll second. Okay, thanks. We have a motion and a second. Uh, let's vote. Commissioner Wood, aye. Commissioner Curtis? Aye. Commissioner Lance? Aye. Commissioner Gunnell? Aye. Commissioner Tolman? Aye. Commissioner Adcock? Aye. Okay, that motion is uh, approved unanimously. So with that, let's move on to agenda item seven. This is Planning Commission business. Um, due to an error on the agenda, we do not have minutes to approve. And do we need a motion to table the table the minutes from our previous? Sure. <laughs> it, it it doesn't matter. It it can just be tabled. We'll we'll bring it on the next meeting. Okay. I mean, it's not on the agenda, right? So officially, we don't have to take any action on it. Right. Okay. Then I suggest we do not need a motion for the minutes, and we'll just handle that next time. Is there any other business we need to take care of in the meeting? I do have one thing to, to just inform you about, um, if I may. Yes, please. Okay, so, uh, let's see, let me share my screen again. So we, we had a, a submittal for uh, uh, the McMullen project that's that's uh, pretty close to the C.S. Lewis Academy, uh, just a little bit south of there. Um, this might look familiar to, to you. It's, it's been a long time since the Planning Commission has looked at the, the preliminary plan. Um, it, it, it came forward as, as the McMullen Twin Homes. Uh, you might remember it. It was like two years ago when the Planning Commission... Uh, Is it? Yes. You're, you're sharing the code, not the picture. Oh, oh. let me fix that. There we go. Is that better? Okay. So uh, you probably remember this as the McMullen Twin Homes. It did receive uh, preliminary approval from the city council. Um, and preliminary plans uh, have three years before they expire. So uh, they're getting close to that, but when they came forward and, and spoke with us about moving forward with this, this project, they, uh, they had a little bit of a change of heart, if you will, uh, a good change of heart. Um, instead of twin homes, they're looking to, to do detached single family homes. Um, so the thing with this is it was approved as, uh, the preliminary plan was approved as twin homes, uh, however, 
looking at this, and, and obviously I, I felt like this would be a welcomed change to their plat. Um, we're, we're trying to, to, to work with them so that they can, can move forward with this project without having to go back and go through preliminary all over again because it's, it's a change from twin homes to single family lots. However, the plat is, is almost identical. So instead of it being uh, attached twin homes in between these, these platted lots, it would just be individual uh, platted lots with single family homes on them. So the plat that really doesn't look that much different. Um, looking at the, the code today, and let me bring this over so I can show you. Um, so you can see uh, changes from approved preliminary plats. Uh, it, it is recognized that through the preliminary review process, the design and street grade stormwater facilities and utilities may necessitate changes from preliminary plats approved by the city council. Um, We're still seeing the plat, not the code. Did you want to show the code? Sorry, I thought I, that would be seen by you because I dragged it over, but I guess I need to reshare that now. So I'm looking at this section of the code that talks about uh, changes in uh, from preliminary plats. It specifies minor changes and major changes. Uh, and if it's a minor change, then it basically be me providing you uh, notice to the uh, notice to the planning commission and city council uh, of such changes. Um, and then it talks about what a minor change would be, gives examples, and what major changes would be. Uh, like I say, for for purposes of this this proposal, uh, because it's a welcome change, uh, and and I'm sure people would be uh, would would rather see the single family lots. I, I wondered if, if this could serve as notice for you. And, and like I say, the plat really doesn't look that much different. It would just be single family detached rather than the twin homes. I think that's reasonable. Um, is there any concern with um, the building envelope? I mean, the difference would be that they now have setbacks on those sides where previously the houses would have been adjoined. I mean, they would be small lots, don't get me wrong, but uh, nonetheless, they would be detached units rather than the, the, the twin homes. All right, go ahead. Since this is an agenda item, if we're gonna actually make a decision, I think it needs to be put on the agenda and also watch our time, we're almost out of time. So, and, and I'm not asking for any action from you. Uh, this would be my interpretation of the code. And so really this is just me providing you notice of, of what's happening. It still needs to go through the final plat process, which would be approved by the DRC. But I mostly want to just make you aware of it so that uh, it wasn't something that you were surprised about after the fact. Is anyone overly concerned about that? OK, fair enough. I think you've okay. done it then. That's all that I had. OK, commissioners, any other business we need to conduct during the meeting? No. Okay, uh, Art, your hand is raised. Did, did you want to say anything else? No, sorry. I'll make a motion to adjourn if you want it. Um, all right, we're getting head nods. Let's do that then. So we will be adjourned at 956. And thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. See ya.